So in this video, we're going to make sense of cash flow estimation. And this video was long awaited for because this seems to be the chapter that most students just don't like to deal with. And in this video, we're going to be able to break down this chapter into six bite-sized pieces in which we're going to understand every single thing you need from the initial cash outflow all the way to a tax shield. And we're going to put this all into a nice and neat, I guess, like, like the video where it makes sense. <laughs> all that said though, once we're able to go through all these topics, we're going to look at three different types of problems from an introductory question to just give you all the, the senses that you need from a medium sized question that you actually may see on a final exam and then to a comprehensive cash flow estimation question that's going to tie in a bunch of different chapters. These questions typically tie in time value of money, bond valuation, equity valuation, equity valuation, and the weighted average cost of capital. So if you stay in this video, you'll really understand everything. And the first thing that we're going to do before we proceed, we're just going to kind of give you additional context. So it's like an introduction to the introduction in which I really want you to understand that, well, the cash flow estimation chapter for an intro to finance class or a perhaps a finance summary during your MBA or master's or even an introduction level one, like level one CFA course. What I want you to, to be able to understand is that we can break down this chapter into really six categories and they're highlighted here on the screen. And we're going to go ahead and walk through them one by one. And then I'll let you know what we're going to do with that, but really what it means for any problem or for anything that you need to solve for in this chapter. So within the cash flow estimation chapter, there are once again, six categories. The first category would be the initial cash outflow, which is the initial investment. How much money are you going to invest into this project today, now? Then we could look at the operating cash flows, right? OCF, which is simple, sales minus costs times one minus the tax rate. We're going to dive deep into that later. Another topic that's extremely important and that ties in between these two boxes here is the change in networking capital. And in this video, you'll understand and you'll walk through some very good examples on these categories, extremely relevant. The next category here that we're going to look at will be the networking capital recapture at the end of a project. Very straightforward. It gets easier from here. Then we're going to look at the salvage value. So how much are we going to be able to recuperate, sell, or gain upon the, the end of the useful life of a project or of anything that we're looking at within this chapter. And finally, once again, we're going to have two boxes, as you can see on the screen, that kind of work together. We're going to be able to understand the final category, which is a tax shield. And why does it matter for a business? And why does the depreciation expense actually work with that? So what's amazing with this video here is that you're going to get an active recall of what you learned in your financial accounting or your intro to financial accounting course. And you're also going to see how this ties in with everything that you've learned within an intro to finance class. That's really what's amazing. Now, before we move on to jumping into each of these buckets one by one, I really want to give you additional context if you just want to kind of get a sense of what we need to do in this chapter. Well, a cash flow estimation problem, it's really understanding whether a company, okay, should accept or reject a project or an investment or anything of the sort. For this chapter, we're gonna call them projects. So once again, we wanna understand whether a company can accept a project or reject a project. How will a company do that? Well, a company will do that by analyzing the six buckets that we've just identified. Understanding, well, yo, what's our initial cash you know, investment here? And then also, well, how much cash flows are we gonna be able to make on this project? What's awesome is that when you take a step back, you notice two things. One, we're going to solve for the net present value by comparing our initial investment to our cash flows that we can expect in the future throughout this project. That's the first bucket. But what's awesome is that once you understand that, and once you also you've looked at my past videos on capital budgeting, you understand that this is simply, very, very simply, a chapter five type of question or a chapter five type of chapter. Because all that we're doing is we're looking at future cash flows, okay? That may be growing, that may be constant, that may be occurring at the beginning of a period, at the end of a period, at a specific time or forever. That's really all that we're doing. And now some, some bells should be ringing in your head is that you realize this is all time value of money. These are cash flows that are occurring, payments that we're getting into the future that we're gonna discount to today. And we're gonna use formulas or we're gonna use simple discounting or we're gonna use a perpetuity formula. There's a bunch of tools that we already know and have. 
So this chapter may may look very big and very scary. It's literally chapter five with a little, you know, a little sauce, a little salt on it, a little bit of a twist. It's very simple. Okay. Now, one last thing I'd like to kind of discuss within the notion of this being simply a time value of money chapter in which we're going to look at payments that we're going to discount to T0, and then we're going to compare them to the initial investment to see whether we're going to accept or reject a project, is that, well, this chapter is going to look at multiple timelines, right? Because we can think about every single one of these as being their own set of cash flows, okay? We have our initial cash outflow, which occurs at T0, but then we have our operating cash flows that occur at T1, T2, blah, blah, blah. Then we have our net working capital that may occur as well. So all of these different buckets are kind of considered as being their own cash flows, okay? And what's awesome is that, well, when we're dealing with a cash flow estimation chapter, this leads us to two different methods on how we want to solve these, these, these problems. One is by building a comprehensive cash flow table in which you're going to look at year zero, year one, year two, year three, et cetera, whatever the length of the project. And then you're going to be looking at, okay, well, here we have our operating cash flows. Then we have our networking capital. Then we have our recapture. Then we have our salvage value, et cetera. And you're just going to add them up to find your free cash flow for that year. You're going to do that for every single year. And then you're just going to discount it simply like we did in chapter five for time value of money. That's one way. I feel like the table way is a way that a lot of students could use, but there's actually another solution, another method here is by simply finding the present value for every single, of the, every single one of the categories we just discussed. So this means that you're finding the present value for the initial cash outflow, which is obviously going to be itself. You're finding the present value for the operating cash flows. You're finding the present value for the change in networking capital. You're finding the present value for the networking capital recapture. You're finding the net present value for the salvage value in the tax shield. Then once you have all of these present values together, it's easy to just sum them up. That's probably the best way to solve these questions. And that's exactly what we're going to walk through uh, in this video. Okay. I really believe that that's probably the easiest method, the way that you will never get confused, that you don't need to build a table and it has to be cute. This method is simple. You just solve for six different present values and you add them up together. And if the, if the output is positive, then you accept the project the output is negative, then you reject the project. Now, still, this is just an introduction to the introduction. We're just talking it out right now in this little webinar. So don't you worry, it's gonna make sense. We're gonna walk through this step by step. So now we're at, the, we're at the end of our introduction to the introduction, okay? And we're gonna be going through every single one of the categories that I mentioned beyond, uh, I guess before, okay? And in every single one of these little like portions of the video, I'm gonna give you an explanation on, for example, what is operating cash flows? Then I'm gonna give you context for a business. Well, how do we actually see that? Three, or the third part to this, is us drawing a timeline to really visualize what it means, right? So you know I said it's a timeline, and then a timeline, and then a timeline. And then finally, we're gonna essentially just, once again, double down on the consequence for a business, okay? That's how we're gonna walk through every single one of these categories, one by one. Then once we've done that, we're gonna jump into some questions, we're going to make sense of this. It's going to be a beautiful walk in the park. And you'll see how I um, set up a methodology, a step-by-step, -step, how I go about solving these problems on an exam, and then how I use the, uh, the technique right, of summing up all the present values to do this quickly and efficiently. So that said, enough of me talking with this slide. We're going to move on to another slide in which you'll understand how we walk through every single step one by one. So let's begin with our initial cash outflow. That's something that I like to call as well as being our initial investment. Now, listen, the initial investment is pretty straightforward and we're gonna highlight stuff together, okay? Take this as an opportunity for us to just kind of have a conversation. Now, if this is easy for you. If you don't need to look at this specific step, do not hesitate to skip through the video, okay? Um, go to the exam-like questions at the end. Uh, go to maybe a better understanding of the NWC, the networking capital, okay? Don't, uh, don't feel the need to listen to my spiel because this is just meant to be uh, something that's comprehensive to help students and to feel more comfortable with the material. So let's begin with the initial investment, also known as CF0, all right? Different schools may have different terminologies, but the idea here is that no matter what, or most often than not, a project will have an initial investment, the original cost, okay, to get the project going. 
And this is considered, of course, as a cash outflow, okay? So when we're looking at adding up all of our present values together, well, of course, CF0, the initial investment, will be a negative value, all right? That has to be extremely clear to you. It'll be a negative value. Now, an initial investment will generally consist of a lump sum. So it's a lump sum. It's a singular amount, okay? And the reason why that's important for you is because, well, it's a lump sum that you're getting today. And money that you're getting today means that it's equal to itself. It means that no discounting, no adjustments are required, all right? So let me give you a very, 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 very simple example. So no discounting and no adjustments. Before we look at the timeline, although the timeline is very simple. So if you're in a question, all right, and they, I'll go, we'll go with the East My Helps Blue. If you have a question and they tell you, you have a 500K initial investment, all right? Well, 500K initial investment means that it was received at T equals zero. And for that reason, the present value of money you receive today is equal to itself. So the present value of your cash flow investment, of your initial investment, not bad, will be equal to 500 grand. And of course, it'll be a negative. Or in other words, it really depends on how you want to go about it. But just know that you're, this is a negative value. This is a negative output. So it's not going to make your money go up. It's going to make your money go down. All right? So that's one way to look at it. Another proof for you, if that's not too clear on why the present value of money received today is equal to itself, um, I always like to give multiple views, is you could simply do 500K. Let's assume the discount rate is like, I don't know, we'll do one plus K, right, to the power of N. But what's awesome is that we know that this is received today. So you could just do, call it the discount rate is, I don't know, 10%. But because this is received today, N is equal to zero, the 500K, would then be equal to 500K divided by one, and that's gonna give you 500K. So just an additional view for you. It's very straightforward. The idea here is that you're getting money here, and that's gonna be a cash outflow, okay? Very straightforward. We don't need to spend too much time on this. Just remember that this will always be the negative value that this is your initial investment. And because this is a webinar, I'm gonna take the liberty drink some water across the video just so I could continue you know to be hydrated and give you uh, some resources here so so far so good we understand how to get the initial investment now we're going to move on to something very interesting the operating cash flows and of course the timeline well this is only going to occur at one point on our timeline here at t equals zero I hope that's clear I hope that's clear so let's move on Let's go look at our operating cash flows, okay? So before we look at the formula that's written right here, I would like to take some time to really break down the different portions of your operating cash flows, okay? So of course, you're going to have sales, you're going to have your costs, and you're going to have your tax rates. And this is very much an active recall to what you learned in your intro to finance class, intro to financial accounting class, okay? Because we're just kind of mimicking our income statement here, right? It's a very simplified version of your income statement in which you have, you know, I'll kind of do this, in which you had, remember, revenue less expenses. And sorry if I'm writing dirty right now, but the idea is that, you know, uh, we're having a conversation. That's going to give you your earnings before income tax. Then you're going to subtract your income tax. And that would give you your actual, like, you know, profit here. In other words, your cash flows. All right. Now, what's awesome is that you could actually simplify this on your exam or when you're studying as simply being equal to sales minus cost, right? That's what we did right here. I hope that's clear. So we have sales, less costs, so revenue, less expenses. And then we're going to multiply that by one minus the tax rate, which is going to give you your profit. It's as easy as that. And that's going to be our operating cash flows. Very straightforward. I guess I said we're not going to begin with the formula, but heck, let's begin with the formula. Now, what I want to make very, very straight, well, what I wish would be very straightforward for everybody here is that, of course, we have our sales, we have our costs, and we have our tax rate. Now, sales on an exam, okay, it can be provided as being a constant set of revenue. So every single year, for example, you're going to receive 100K within this project or it can be growing, growing, growing revenues in which they would say, for example, you're receiving 100K at the end of year one, but then that number will grow by 5% every single year. 
such that at year two, we well, don't have 100K anymore. You have $105,000, all right? That's very, very important to remember. So it can be either constant or growing. Now, uh, you know, it's funny because when you go to uni or, you know, CJF here in Quebec or whatever, we typically hate when teachers use the slides to kind of like talk. But in this case, yo, these slides are dope. So you gotta, I'm gonna use them myself because they really put us in the right position. So it's funny how it's full circle. Now, I wanna say one more thing though, because more complex questions and we're still dealing with sales, they may say, a few, they may not give you revenues or kind of like a number to work with. They may actually tell you, yo, you have a number of clients and each client will provide X amount of revenue, okay? So then you're actually gonna have to solve for revenues yourself. So for example, they may say, all right, you have, call it 400K clients and they cost $5 each per client, okay? Such that you would have to do 400K times five. Now, I guess I could do some basic math. I'm gonna say that that's $2 million, all right? And that would be your revenue. So it's important to understand that sometimes they could throw a curveball at you, okay? Now we can move on to the next step, which is cost. Now cost, typically on exams, they could be given in two different manners, okay? They could be given as simply being a percentage of your sales. In other words, a percentage of your revenues. So if your revenues, for example, was a million dollars per year on a constant basis, and they tell you that your costs are 20% per year, and this would, I mean, 20% of your revenues each year, this would mean that you would have, if it's a million dollars, 200K as being your cost. Okay, such that sales minus cost would give you 800K. Hopefully that's clear. So anyways, I'm not gonna go too far with that. And then they could also give you just a constant value. So they say, yo, your, set, your cost, it's 100 grand a year. Plug that in, it's as simple as that, okay? However, as we mentioned in the previous bucket for sales, they may also let you know that, yo, 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 no, you know what? You're gonna find the cost per client, okay? You're gonna find that number. And it'll be the same little gymnastic that we've done on the previous bucket at which you're gonna do number of clients time the cost per client. Now on an exam, cost per client could also be said the cost of, acqu of acquiring a client. It may not always be an acute, you know, simple, straightforward fashion. So it's always important to kind of understand that if they don't give you a percentage of sales, if they don't give you a constant value that's easy to plug in, sometimes extra work will be required on your, on your part. Okay, to be able to kind of get to this point. Now, another thing that I'd like to mention when it comes to costs, okay, is that costs can be divided into two like categories. It can be divided in variable costs or fixed costs. Now, if you're ever given a question like this at which you have variable costs, so for example, the cost of acquiring a client, then you have fixed costs and which on the, the question they may say like, I don't know, um, the cost of your office every single year is a hundred grand, okay? So you may have two different costs, variable costs and fixed costs. Variable costs, if I were you, I would always mix them in your sales. So what do I mean by this? So if you know that, for example, you have 400K clients, all right? And you know, for those clients, it'll probably, it'll generate revenues of call it $10 per client. And it'll cost you $5, uh, I guess I'll put it as $4, $4 to acquire a client. I would just say, you know what? I'm gonna make this simpler for me. I'm just gonna eliminate my variable cost portion and I'm gonna include it in my revenue such that if it costs you $4 to get a client but you make $10 for clients, technically your net margin for every single client is $6. So you could find your revenues as simply being six times 400K. So that would be something that I would do. And this, in this case, would give you $2.4 million as your revenue. And then you would only need to look at your fixed costs. And let's say your fixed cost is call it 400K, you would have sales minus cost as being equal to $2 million, right? Because you took this amount plus this amount. So this is just another little trick that you may not see in your class, right? That they may not talk about is that sometimes costs can be divided into two buckets variable costs and fixed costs. If you're given a question at which you're given variable costs and fixed costs, I recommend placing your variable costs straight into your revenues. In other words, subtract that amount if it's a variable amount, right? If it's variable per every client or every output that or every unit of whatever you have, just plug it in there. That's exactly what we did here. We had $10, right? Revenue per client, okay? 
But we also know that every client costs us four bucks. Let's make this simpler for us. 10 minus four, $6 is gonna be our sales per client, okay? Multiplied by the number of clients we have, 2.4 million, less our fixed costs. We know that our sales minus cost would be equal to $2 million. It's a different way to go about it. Different students may wanna go about it in different ways, but here's a recommendation that I use that makes it simpler for myself, okay? So now that we have that, it's not over yet, okay? Because if the question, all right, notice how I wrote, unless stated otherwise for looking at the tax rate, um, your earnings before income taxes are going to be subject to taxes, okay? So you're gonna to have to multiply your sales less cost by one minus the tax rate. In this example, you could have done 2 million times if the tax rate is 30% times one minus 0 0.30. And that would give you essentially, if I could do some quick math, after tax cash flows of $1.4 million, okay? So you always need to do that. Now, one thing that I'd like you to kind of remember is that some questions, they may just straight up give you your after tax cash flows. Some questions may just say, yo, you know what? You don't need to do all this gymnastic that I just introduced. We're just gonna give you after tax cash flows and you could run with that. Because if you're given after tax cash flows, you don't need to calculate your sales, you don't need to calculate your costs, and you don't need to compute your one minus tax rate. All right, this will be your input for OCF. It's as easy as that. If they just give you your after tax cash flows. So I talked about a lot of stuff within sales, costs, and tax rate. I could know that this is overwhelming, and I definitely hope that you pause the video because I, I was kind of freestyling it, and you just highlight, write down the pieces that really work for you. Okay. But if we just do a quick executive summary of these three different categories, subcategories that we looked at, it could look as follows. Now, the most complex forms form of operating cash flows can be divided into sales, costs, and tax rates. You would be required to compute every single one of them. Now, sales could be either constant, growing, or they may even require you to solve for your sales. At times, students may even want to do the individual like revenue per client less the individual cost per client to find like a adjusted sales value. Okay. Now within the second subcategory of operating cash flows, we have costs. Now costs could be either a percentage of your sales. It could also be just a simply constant value. What's even more interesting is that your cost could be divided into two buckets, variable costs and fixed costs. If you have variable costs, I highly recommend that you just include it into your sales. Make it easier for you. Just deal with your fixed costs. And your fixed costs will literally be a fixed amount regardless of the number of clients, regardless of the output of the company. Now, just to kind of double down on this notion is that for sure, sometimes you may be required to find the, the total costs that you may have based on the number of clients, the number of units of production that you may have. Now, finally, within the last subcategory, the tax rate, it's very important to remember that, listen, you know, this is like in our intro to finance, uh, intro to financial accounting class at which you're going to need to take your earnings before income tax and multiply them by your tax rate. That's going to give you your tax expense. Now you're going to take that amount, that tax expense, and you're going to subtract it to your earnings before income tax. But that seems like a lot of stuff to do. And we could actually simplify it as simply being sales minus cost times one minus the tax rate. That's how you earn your operating cash flows. Okay. So our spiel could be kind of boiled down to that little like executive summary. Now, the reason why this is important is because once we find our operating cash flows for every single year, we could, this is where like the magic happens. We can do something crazy with it is we're gonna have to discount them, okay? We're gonna have to discount all these operating cash flows to the present value. So two T zero, because two things, they're not occurring today. So they're not equal to themselves. And the reason why they're not equal to themselves is the second thing is because money received tomorrow is not as valuable as money received today. Remember that we're using a NPV approach. So we need, we must discount our future cash flows to the present value. All right. And the reason why this is really dope is because we've we've done this in the past. We've done this gymnastic of discounting future cash flows to the present value within our time value of money chapter. So this is important because I want you to be able to remember that, well, operating cash flows and all the different categories that we're going to look at that are not occurring today could simply look at, look like all of the different cash flows that we've seen in our time value of money chapter. 
So I'm talking about our normal annuities, our growing annuities, our annuity dues, our perpetuities, and our growing perpetuities. We could actually arm ourselves with those formulas to solve for these effectively and quickly. And if you're even more sick with it, you could actually plug them in within your financial calculator. You don't need to go through the formula if you don't remember them, or if you don't have it in your cheat sheets, or if you're just not good with it. You could plug all these in one by one into your calculator using the CF function or the PMT slash PV function. Really, they all, they all work, and I have a bunch of videos on that. And you'll be able to find the present value of this small category. It's really as awesome and as easy as that. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, yo, how do I do that? Our operating cash flows are divided into three different topics. Like, this is mad complicated. Well, that's why I recommend that if you are on an exam, I would always recommend that you always just solve for the first year, okay? Solve for the first year of operating cash flows. So for the first year of operating cash flows, I would recommend you to do exactly this. Sales, right? Minus your costs. That's going to give you an amount. It's going to give you your EBIT. And then you can multiply that amount. By one minus the tax rate. And that's gonna give you an output. Okay, that's gonna give you an output. I don't know what that output will be, right? This is a hypothetical. But this output, if I were you, if I was on an exam, if I was practicing, and you'll see that I'll do exactly that. And we have our methodology that really like says, yo, do this. But that output, okay, if it's constant, you could just plug it into your form to your like formula as PMT, okay. Or you could plug it in into your, into your financial calculator as your CO1, right? And then you just put FO1 as a number of years within the project. So this could either be your PMT or this could simply be your CO1, okay? So this is really, really awesome. Now, this, isn't, this is usually what I would do if we're dealing with a normal annuity, if we're dealing with a annuity due, or for dealing with a perpetuity, because then it's just a question of like plugging it in. You found your payment, right? If it's constant. I'll give you another example. So it's very, very clear. Sorry, I have, have allergies. So I may like rub my nose at times. I'm sorry if that's disgusting, my bad. You could just like hide my portion on the left. But let's say your sales is like a hundred bucks a year. Your costs are 20 bucks a year, such that your EBIT is 80. And then your tax rate, I don't know, let's call it 10%. So it'd be one minus 10% you would have an output of $72, okay? This would be your after-tax cash flows. Now, if you know that you're making $72 every single year, right, all the way to year five, right? and this is your PMT, I hope that's clear, you notice how this looks exactly like our chapter five time value of money chapter, right? So then you could just plug it in within your formula, or you could plug it in within your calculator and put CO1 as, C as 72, then put your FO1 as being five, right? I hope that's clear. But what's really interesting here is that sometimes you may have, and also, by the way, if this is a constant output, there's no reason why this won't be the same every single year. That's what I was trying to get to. But what happens here is that sometimes you may be given growing cash flows, right? Or a growing number of clients or whatever the case may be, such that every single year, well, your sales will increase and your costs may increase such that you will need to maybe use your actual formula instead because your calculator may be actually like working against you because it's hard to just find the value every single year. So my, my takeaway here is that if you are dealing with normal constant cash flows, it's simple. Just plug your output simply into your calculator or into your formula. But if you're dealing with growing cash flows, I highly, 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 highly recommend that you solve for your output which is our 72 bucks at year one type of thing. And then you plug them in within your formula because it's going to make it much, much, much easier for you to find the present value of this specific category. And now you're, that I hope this like rings a few bells for you because if you were using the table method, which is the first method I talked about in the like first ghetto introduction, you would have to find these values for every single year and that would be deadly. Or you would have to find the entire value for the first year this is not like an efficient method. Go one by one, minimize the number of inputs that you need to add to really make this simpler for you. So this is really the best method in my opinion. So of course, the last thing that I'd like to talk about for operating cash flows freestyle is that these cash flows are occurring in the future, okay? And if they're occurring in the future, you're not receiving them today, 
And because of that, you have an opportunity cost. You need to discount those cash flows to T0. And that's going to be the present value of your operating cash flow list. All right. So that's the first bucket. I'm going to drink a little bit of water before we move on to our networking capital. Our networking capital, well, that's a sexy, that's a sexy one. You know, that's a that's a one, that's one where it's funny how they don't explain that properly all the times uh, or all the time at school. And today in this video, in this cash flow estimation video, I'm going to try my best to give you like a no BS perspective on it. Okay. So very straightforward. Notice how these are cash flows occurring in the future. Bring them back to T0. Looks just like our time value of money chapter. And we know that because we use a timeline. Beautiful. So now you're probably like, damn, that's a lot of text. But don't you worry. The reason why there's so much text is because, one, I want to begin by giving you context on what networking capital is all about. And then we can jump into understanding what the change in networking capital actually means for a business. Okay. Once we've looked at these two categories, we're actually actually well during we look while we look at those two categories, we're going to arm ourselves with two things: an Excel sheet right here and a timeline to really display what's going on between the two. All right. And once you understand this, this is the only like hard part. Okay. The only like weird part. And once you understand this, you're actually able to jump into the networking capital and capture portion that becomes a breeze because you kind of, you, you get you have like this intuitive sense of what's going on. So it's awesome. So let's get right into it. Sorry, I had to do a little burp. I'm sorry if I'm a little bit disgusting right now. It's, it's going to be a long one. So hopefully you're, you're still here with me. So the, some context on the networking capital or just context on networking capital. The first thing that I'd like to describe, and this is something that we've seen a little bit within our intro to financial accounting course, is that networking capital simply looks at current assets, less your current liabilities, okay? And I'm gonna jump from this bullet point to another one because I want you to understand simply that networking capital is current assets, less current liabilities. That's what you wanna be able to kind of just visualize at the very beginning. This is going to be our first rule for our little networking on uh, networking capitals like uh, portion. Okay, so we'll, we'll name this as A. Now let's get a quick introduction to what are current assets and why do they matter? Because once we understand that, we can move on to current liabilities, and then you really, 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 really will understand what networking capital really tries to highlight. Let's go ahead. So common current assets. Okay, you're looking at accounts receivables inventory, prepaid expenses, and a bunch of other ones. But really, the main ones that you saw in your intro to financial accounting class, the main ones that you will see if you go look at financial statement for a company, will simply be, you know, accounts receivables, inventory, maybe merchandise, and prepaid expenses. To give you some quick context on what accounts receivables and etc. actually stand for, I'll kind of like talk about them a bit. Accounts receivables, it's very straightforward. Let's say that I sold you this calculator. Okay, I sold you the calculator, but you decide to pay me at a later date, such that you are going to owe me money, and I am expecting to receive the money that I made off this sale. I didn't receive cash instead. Okay, so if you remember our T accounts from back in the days, this would mean that, okay, 100%, my accounts receivables would be debited for, call it, I don't know, 10 bucks, and my revenues would be credited for $10, right? I created a revenue because I fulfilled my service or my product or my duty to you, but I didn't receive the cash like in exchange for that. I actually received the other asset, the other current assets that we call accounts receivables. So you expect to receive cash from your customers because they paid you in, you know, in nothing yet. So you're expecting to receive that money and hopefully you expect to receive that money within the year. Hopefully that gave you a little bit of context. If not, I have a bunch of other videos on this. Now inventory is simply all of the inventory you have at, at your office, at, at your warehouse, at your gig. So if I'm a guy, if I'm a person that sells calculators, well, I would have a bunch of calculators in inventory. So I bought 20,000 calculators in the hopes of selling them all. But until I sell them, they're only inventory. And inventory is interesting, right? Think about it. If I buy more inventory, I had to pay it in cash, okay? So I hope that's clear. And I'll, I guess as we go, I'll draw like a few uh, T accounts. If my inventory increases, okay? This would mean that I'm debiting inventory. And let's say for, we'll use $100, but I had to pay inventory with something. I had to pay inventory with cash, right? 
So that would mean that I spent a hundred dollars if I'm increasing my inventory. So now you're slowly starting to get the vibe. Okay. And prepaid expenses is simply like, let's say I would buy, um, let's say I need to rent an office and I decide to pay all of my year's rent before I actually use, like, I'm only at month one, we're in December or January, sorry. And I paid a full year's worth of rent. Well, come on now, I've prepaid some expenses, okay? And for sure, it's gonna give you a future benefit, but right now you spent more than what you actually like used that, that you actually expensed. And that's also a loss of cash, all right? So what I'm trying to highlight here is that, actually I'll keep this here, is that when you're increasing your current assets, okay? When your current assets are increasing, as you can see here, well, it actually kind of results in a negative effect in your cash holdings. And it results in a negative effect in your cash. And I mean, our example at the bottom of the screen really highlights that. If you have an increase in your inventory, which is a current asset, well, that inventory had to come from somewhere, right? You had to pay for it in cash. And if your cash receivables are increasing, well, that means that you're not receiving cash for the sales that you're doing, okay? And all of those things are gonna have effects on your financial statements. It may mean that you're overstating your income or understating your income, okay? So that's really important. So another way to look at this is that if let's say our accounts receivables were to decrease from one year to another, that means that people owe you less money, okay? And that would mean that you, if they owe you less money it's because they paid you that money, assuming no like doubtful accounts or whatever. So that would mean that you have a positive effect on cash holdings. And that's awesome. So you kind of notice something if you, especially if you're sharp and you remember uh, our statement of cash flows and your intro to financial accounting class is that, well, an increase, okay, in current assets is actually a negative effect to your cash. And that's what we highlighted in our operating activity section in our statement of cash flows. Whereas a decrease in current assets is a positive effect in cash. And that's exactly what we added in our statement of cash flows back in the days, right, in the previous course. So that's extremely, extremely important. And you'll, it'll make more sense as you proceed towards our current liabilities and as we restate what networking capital tries to highlight. But before we go there, I'm gonna run through an example just to really double down on what current assets really mean for a company, okay? So let's look at Nike. And Nike would observe a negative effect to its cash if its accounts receivables increased by $50 million from 2021 to 2022. So it had a smaller amount and now it increased okay, by $50 million. So they are owed $50 million in accounts receivable more. So this would indicate that a portion of Nike sales this year, all right, $50 million of Nike sales this year were fulfilled. They sold the shoes, right? They sold the shirts, they sold the hoodies, but they didn't receive cash for those sales, okay? Such that if we were to look at their income statement, revenue would be high. Revenue would be high by $50 million, right? Extra, in a sense, a portion of it. But that $50 million, right, that we said that we made in revenue, that essentially we made in earnings, was actually not fulfilled in cash, okay? So we overstated the amount of cash we actually said we received by $50 million. So we're, we, we're lost in terms of $50 million in cash that we don't have, okay? That's important. So in plain English, if Nike has an increase in their accounts receivables by $50 million, that means that Nike did not receive $50 million in cash, although they recognize that revenue on their income statement. And that's really what the first portion of our networking capital formula tries to highlight, okay? Very important to understand that. And of course, you could do a proof, and that's how I studied back in the days. I would always work off proofs to really understand, well, well how does one thing affect all of our different statements? And if you're actually like trying to interview for like some, uh, I don't know, like some gigs in finance or in business, you may have to actually be able to walk through these different effects on your, uh, on your statements. So that's important to understand. Now let's move on to common current liabilities. Okay, the second portion of our networking capital formula. Now common current liabilities, well, it's easy. It consists of accounts payables, okay? Accrued liabilities and deferred revenue. All right, it's as simple as that. Now, accounts payables, very straightforward. Let's say that because I sell calculators, I have to go find a supplier. I have to go to Texas Instruments. And I said, yo, um, I want to buy $20,000 worth of, of calculators, but I'm going to pay you like four months from now, not right now, like in the future type of thing. And if I do that, that means I didn't pay them in cash. So I'll give you an example. 
All right. If I do that, that means I didn't pay them in cash. I'm gonna walk through a uh, a, a little uh, little proof here so that you really see it. So let's say I got um, so I got inventory. I don't know why I erased it then. That's crazy. So I got an inventory of hundred dollars. Okay, I got this much inventory for a hundred of of, uh, of calculators, but I didn't pay them in cash. I actually essentially created a liability. I created an obligation towards my supplier, okay? Such that I credited accounts payable for $100, all right? Well, that's awesome though, because it means that I now work off, I work off credit, I work off debt, I work off a future obligation, but my pockets are still filled with cash. I got inventory that I could go sell for cash and I got to not spend cash to make that money, all right? So that's awesome, that's really cool. So that would actually highlight perhaps a positive effect to our cash holdings because typically you would need to spend that, you would need to spend $100 in this case, but we didn't, okay? Um, I'm just trying to be funny and kind of trying to make some sense of it, of it. So for sure there are different videos out there that are more formal with formal definitions, but this is just a quick introduction, okay? So, you know, of course there are some holes and some gaps here, but if we look at accrued liabilities, accrued liabilities is just another form to discuss all the different types of payables you may have. For, ex for example, um, interest payable, or for example, wages payable, or salaries payable, et cetera, et cetera. That's just a different name that we could kind of call our accrued liabilities, okay? So same framework that we've applied to our inventory and accounts payable to some, some extent, we could apply here. And then there's deferred revenue. Deferred revenue is a really interesting one. It's really interesting because it applies, for example, for services, for stuff of that nature. If, for example, let's say you sell, let's say you sell a service like myself back in the days where I would tutor uh, students. Sometimes students would need to, would not need to, but would decide to pay me upfront. Okay. Let's say that they decided to pay me upfront a hundred dollars before I taught them. Well, if you understand the revenue recognition principle and all that good stuff, you would understand that because I didn't teach them yet, because I didn't fulfill the service that they paid me for yet, well, I can't realize this as being revenue. I could only realize this as being deferred revenue, such that I would credit our, my deferred revenue because I have a future obligation towards my students, and I would debit $100, let's, just, let's say that's the, the example, for cash, such that I'm able to balance my equation. So deferred revenue is another type of liability that you may have. It's usually a short-term one because nobody would pay you two years before they actually give you the stuff, right? Unless you know, you're looking at real estate, which is a different type of business, or if you're looking at you know, cars or pre, uh, pre purchases on cars, if you're looking at deposits uh, on like, I don't know, two-year leases, it gets, it gets you know, strange there. But the idea here is that for just simple examples, deferred revenue is a obligation towards your customers because you need to provide a service to them into the future, but they decided to pay you in cash today. So these are a bunch of different liabilities, current liabilities that you may see just so you get some context. Now, what I want you to understand, and it goes back to our example that we have highlighted at the bottom here, is that if we have a year, you know, year over year increase in current liabilities, well, this is gonna result in a positive effect on our cash holdings, okay? And the reason why this results in a positive effect in our cash holdings is because, well, dude, you didn't pay your supplier in cash. You didn't fulfill an obligation, okay? But you, you got to essentially save your resources, save your time. You got to put your time elsewhere, but you still got paid for a service before, okay? You had to pay, you know, your suppliers, but you decided not to, or you just didn't do it yet, such that you get to keep your cash. So an increase in current liabilities actually kind of has a positive effect on your cash holdings. And the reason why it has a positive effect on your cash holdings is because, well, sometimes, if you just think about it, it, it would mean that you didn't actually, it's like you didn't actually have an expense that occurred. Okay, that's the best way to look at it. Now, conversely, a year to year decrease in current liabilities will result in a negative effect on cash holdings. And the reason why it's gonna result in a negative effect on cash holdings is because if you got a current liability, okay, that decreased, such as a payable, right? You know this payable that we have right here? But when this payable gets eliminated, when that obligation, that liability gets debited, well, I had to pay, I had to pay my supplier somehow. I had to pay them in cash. So if my current liabilities are decreasing, well, it means I had to pay some cash, some cash I had to get out of the business, okay? And for that reason, that's gonna have a negative effect on cash holdings, of course. Cash is being eliminated, all right? Now we won't go into the proof within the statements and everything, but you could actually visualize that as well. 
So that said, let's look at an example. <laughs> voice crack, my bad. Let's look at an example with uh, Microsoft, okay? And we're gonna look at what would happen at Microsoft if, okay, if its accounts payables increased by $100 million from 2021 to 2022. Well, this would mean that they would have a positive effect to their cash holdings because they did not pay for a liability, right? For whatever they purchased, all right? They did not pay for it. They built a liability instead. For that reason, this would mean that they saved $100 million, okay? And this is a really good definition here is that this would indicate that a portion of Microsoft's purchases, purchases were not paid in cash up front. And in plain English, Microsoft didn't pay $100 million in cash, although they may have recognized the expenses, you know, led, like attached to that for that amount on their income statement. It's another good way to look at it. All right, so they did not pay for cash. And what's awesome here is that everything that we just talked about are things that we've seen in our intro to financial accounting class. This is being shown in our statement of cash flows, right? An increase in current liabilities and a decrease in current liabilities. Well, they have kind of like indirect effects to our cash holdings. That's the indirect method in our statement of cash flows. So now we know, okay? Now we understand, well, what does an increase in current assets do? And what does an increase in current liabilities do, okay? So if our current assets are large, okay? And our current liabilities are smaller than our current assets. This would mean that we would have a difference between our current assets and our current liabilities. But we know now that positive numbers of like a positive value for our current assets, well, it actually doesn't indicate that we have cash. It actually means that cash is being trapped in the business, okay? That cash is actually being overstated and that we don't actually have that cash to work with right now. And current liabilities conversely, well, if there are nice number, a bigger number, if they're increasing, well, it means that we're essentially able to kind of keep that cash working with us. We're able to run with that cash. So what's awesome here is that if we look at current assets, less current liabilities, well, we're able to really highlight the net effect to our cash within a given year or a given operating cycle. We're really able to understand, well, where is our cash right now? And if you kind of get a sense of this is that, well, typically your current assets will be smaller than your current liabilities, and with that, you're able to understand that some cash is being lost in the business. Some cash is being trapped into a given project, right? And that's why I highlighted this here, and I'll put it in green, is that the networking capital formula is a very good method to highlight how much cash is being trapped in a business's current operations or how much cash is trapped in a business's project or a new project, right? Because you know that a new project will require a different set of current assets and a different set of current liabilities. And the difference between the two will highlight how much actual cash is being invested actively or is being trapped or is within the cycle of that project, okay? So that's important to understand. And that's why on exams, on exam-like questions, or just within your, your courses, if you paid attention a little bit there, they would say that some projects will require a immediate initial investment in networking capital. Okay, that's important because that immediate like networking capital investment within the project was really going to highlight current assets minus current liabilities. Okay, so with that said, we understand now if we go to our change in networking capital. So what's on the right hand side is we understand that okay, networking capital it can be expressed as a net impact to our cash for a company. Okay, so we know that well if we have a positive networking capital. Well, this would mean that we have a negative effect to cash, right? Because this would mean that our current assets are bigger than our current liabilities. And we know that bigger current assets is no bueno realistically for our cash. It's saying that we have less cash than we actually do because we're overstating this stuff, all right? And we know that a negative networking capital, it will technically, that indicates a positive effect on cash holdings, okay? But here's where the magic happens because on a year to year, like just on a, in a silo, if we look at one year, their networking capital, well, it's not really going to tell us how much, you know, what's the, what's going on with the flow of cash within the business. But if we look at the change in networking capital, for, for example, 2020 to 2021, and we notice that our networking capital actually decreased, well, that's going to, that's going to really like, sh like ring some bells for us. Because if we have a year to year, year to year, sorry, decrease in networking capital, well, this indicates 
that less money is being trapped in our business, that more money essentially was able to get freed up from the business. And that's actually a positive cash uh, inflow. It's a positive cash value. It's a positive effect of cash. But if our networking capital increases, well, that means that more current assets, more cash is being lost and trapped in the business to be able to fuel the project, okay? And that's why that change in networking capital is an extremely, 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 extremely valuable tool because it helps us understand, well, how, what is the movement of cash for this project, for our current operations on a year-to-year -year basis? And hopefully the following bullet points will help you kind of understand what I mean. And then of course, our little Excel example, as well as our timeline, will really try to draw upon that, like that, that framework that we established or that concept that context that we built. So a year-to-year -year increase in NWC is going to result, of course, in a negative effect to cash holdings. So in other words, I want you to think of an increase to networking capital from a year-to-year. -year. So the change in networking capital, to be, if it's positive, I want you to think about it as an indication okay, that more cash had to be invested in the current operations of the business. Okay, More cash is being invested in the current operations of the business or more cash is being lost in the operations of the business. There's two frameworks to apply here. Think about it with me. So let's say that our inventory, because our business is growing and because we know we have more demand, well, we require more inventory. So for example, our $100 that we had here, well, now it's like $400, okay? We need more, we need more out there, okay? That would mean that we, that would mean, assuming that this is cash, that we would need, require more cash to be spent in the business. In other words, if our current assets like inventory or merchandise increases, well, that means that more cash had to be invested in the business, okay? Another perspective to take here is that, well, let's say our accounts receivables, well, that increased from year to year because we have more clients, but less of our clients are willing to pay. Well, that would mean that, yo, more money is being trapped in your business. You're supposed to be making that cash, but you didn't make it, all right? So that's a way to look at it. So more cash is either invested into the operations or more cash is being kind of trapped or lost in the operations. And the key takeaway would mean that, well, yo, for all intents and purposes, on a year-to-year -year basis, if that happens, that means that cash was lost, right? If your inventory accounts increases, that means that you had to pay for that inventory somehow. And that somehow is through cash, assuming it's a normal business and that you pay your, uh, your payables. So if we look at a decrease to networking capital, so a year-to-year -year decrease in networking capital, well, that, once again, it indicates a positive effect on our cash holdings. So we have here a positive effect on our cash holdings. And I want you to think of, an in, of a decrease to networking capital as an indication that less cash had to be invested in the current operations of a business. For example, your inventory requirements are decreasing. Maybe you're more like, you're more fast with your inventory. Or for example, your accounts receivables decreased such that you're getting your money better. You're actually like not losing money that's being trapped in the business. So understanding that is very important because that change in networking capital, a decrease in networking capital, well, it can indicate a few things on the side of your current assets and on the side of your current liabilities. But grosso modo, overall, it really does indicate that less cash is being trapped in the business and that less cash is being lost in the current operations of the business. So here's another point. You could also think of a decrease in NWC as an indication that once again, that less cash was trapped in the current operations. And this would indicate that, okay, cash is retrieved or gained on that year to year basis. And once again, that's why change in networking capital is so important. So the reason why that's important, and I'm sorry if I'm like losing my voice a little bit, I'm getting, I'm like excited for y'all because I think you're learning, okay? Um, a change in networking capital, well, it can be considered as a cash outflow or a cash inflow, right? Depending on the nature of the sign. And that's why these two points here are so crucial because we see that, okay, well, if we have an increase in NWC, well, of course, this is gonna be a cash outflow. But if we, have, if we have a decrease in NWC on a year to year basis, this would indicate a cash inflow because we were able to retrieve cash, okay? now. Sometimes NWC will require a immediate initial investment, all right? And I want you to understand that in a question, if they tell you, yo, NWC requires an immediate initial investment, that value, all right, at year zero will have to be negative. So if a question says, for example, 
you need to invest 75K immediately into the project through networking capital. Well, this would mean that this is minus 75K. All right. Very, very, very important. However, sometimes you will see some change in networking capital depending on the requirements on a year to year basis. Right. And that would indicate that you either have some cash inflows or cash outflows throughout the project. And those cash outflows and those cash inflows, well, they have to be discounted to T0, every single one of them individually, okay? So because the change at networking capital at the end of year one, or at the end of year two, or whatever the case may be, well, they're not happening today. And we need to account for those losses or those gains, and we need to discount them back to PB0. So that's kind of like the main points related to the context of NWC and the change in NWC. Now, with that said, I want to walk through a quick like Excel example. It's on this paper here. And hopefully that could like, kind of like tie a bow in everything we just discussed. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. So on the screen now, you see five years. You see year zero all the way to year five, right? And those are displayed through different columns. Then you'll see different rows. You'll see one current assets, two current liabilities, and three networking capital, and four the change in networking capital, which is what we really care about. So what's awesome here is that, of course, you notice that our networking capital, if you do the match yourself, you can do, for example, current assets minus current liabilities, and you're going to get your networking capital, which is A minus B there, if you want to simplify it. And what's awesome is that the rule that I just mentioned, that immediate investment in NWC at year zero, well, that number is always going to be negative because you're just gonna do zero minus 100 type of thing, okay? That's the framework that I want you to apply. So it's always gonna be a negative value. You can either do it from a match perspective or you can do it just from a rule perspective. But then after that, from year zero to, from year, zero to year one, well, we notice that we have a decrease in NWC such that we know that a decrease in NWC, well, that could indicate a few things, right? That could indicate that, for example, we're being more efficient with our accounts receivables, or that we're spending less you know, lost money in inventory. And that would essentially mean that less cash is being trapped in the business or that we're retrieving more cash on a year-to-year -year basis. And that is not being expressed through our financial statements. And that's why we're gonna highlight that change in networking capital as being something that's positive for us. So a decrease in NWC is a essentially a good thing for us is that our change in networking capital would be a positive value here. Okay, so here we would have a minus, here we would have a plus, okay? And then if we look at year one to year two, we notice that it's 75 and 75, right? They're the same value. So the change in networking capital from year one to year two is equal to $0. However, at year three, we notice that our NWC will have increased, all right? Almost twice the same, the, the, the previous value. And in this case, our NWC increased, okay? Which is what I just said, but that indicates that we have a negative change in networking capital, all right? We have minus 70. And we have minus 70 for all those three years. And these increases in NWC, well, that's a bad thing for us because it means that more money is being trapped in the business. And that's why when we look for a change in networking capital, we get negative values on year three, year four, and year five. For that reason, we understand now that for some years, well, the change is positive and in some years it changes negative right it has a no like no impact at year two for us however at year three well that increase in nwc that has a negative impact for us because that means more money is being lost for that reason we have minus 70 for those years <clears throat> now once you find all of those values right you found a value for year zero all the way to the value for year five what i need you to do now is to understand well hey those cash flows are occurring either right now if it's at year zero or into the future from year one to year five. Well, those cash flows, they have to be discounted. And that's exactly what we did here. Notice how we're gonna take all of these cash flows one by one and we're gonna discount them. Of course, by now, I hope it's clear. Cash flows at year zero don't need to be discounted, but the rest they do. And then essentially what I'm gonna want you to do is just sum them up. And that's gonna give you your present value for your net working capital or your change in networking capital. Now, this was a lengthy process. We talked about a lot of things, but what's awesome here is that the more questions you do and the more you walk through this concept, and honestly, the more you look at other videos other than myself, you'll be able to really get a good sense of what NWC is. And this may not be the solution, right, to you to really feel like you know everything here, but hopefully it's like one step towards that, okay? So with that said, I'm gonna drink a little bit of water. 
and we're going to move towards getting our portion on <clears throat> on our network and capital recapture. And what's awesome here is that this is going to be super, super straightforward. All right, it's very easy. It doesn't take too much like heavy lifting on your on your behalf. All right, so notice how there's almost nothing on the screen now because it gets really easy. And we're gonna walk through this and hopefully once again, with the information that was provided uh, previous to or prior to this portion here of NWCR, you'll be able to really like, you know, understand this. <clears throat> I'm sorry that my voice is cracking. I guess I didn't plan this as, I didn't think it would be as, as long or I, I guess I didn't eat enough or I didn't drink enough or whatever the case may be. But that said, I'm still super excited because I really think that this is something that you, all of you students would need, right? It's something that I would have wanted if I would have taken the course. And hopefully I'm able to like low key explain things correctly. I don't know. All right, that said, networking capital recapture. So once again, we understand now that, well, the networking capital recap, well, it's just networking capital, right? Is money that's being lost in the business. And that's why we look at the change in networking capital to figure out, well, how much more money was is being lost in the business or how much money did we retrieve that was lost, right? That's kind of like the way we're looking at it. Now, the thing is here is that once a project is finished or once the division of a business is terminated, well, all of the networking capital attached to that business in an ideal world, well, it's now no longer, it doesn't need to exist anymore. And when it doesn't need to exist anymore, we can essentially retrieve it. We can recapture all of the networking capital into that business, into that like portion of the, of the business or the project. So what we could coin this as is we could say that the networking capital recapture is just us retrieving, okay, and I'll highlight it here. It's us or the business retrieving all of the cash that was trapped in the current operations or projects of the company, all right? So this is why on exam questions, they'll say, hey, at the end of the project, the firm will be able to recapture all of their networking capital, all right? But what I want you to remember here is that what you're going to recapture is not essentially the singular value that you have here at year five. You're going to recapture the sum of all the change in networking capital, okay? Because some of the money along the way was retrieved and some of the money along the way was added. So you don't want to find one singular networking capital. You want to find all of the change in networking capital as being your amount. Now, this is probably the best way that I would look at it, okay? So with that said, Networking capital will typically consist of a cash inflow, all right? It will typically consist of a cash inflow, and for that reason, it'll be a positive value. And this is interesting because once we get to the end of all of these buckets, you'll understand that there's only really like maybe one or two cash outflows, and the rest is all cash inflows. So that's pretty interesting. And the networking capital recapture is generally going to consist of a lump sum at the end of the project, okay? And therefore, it's going to require discounting because that cash flow, as you can see on our timeline, assuming that it finishes at year five, right, the project, that cash flow, that networking capital cash flow that you're going to recapture at year five, well, it's not happening today. And because of that, we got to discount it all the way back to T0. All right, it's as easy as that. So it'll require discounting. Now, just for some additional context, and I'll, I'll give you like a perspective. And there's two types of recaptures that you may have, right? Some projects or some questions, they may have just a networking capital value for year one. And some projects will have networking capital from year one all the way for, I mean, year zero, sorry, all the way from year zero, all the way to, to the end of the project. So we'll call this at end. If your networking capital was just an initial, you know, investment that was required, for example, let's say, I don't know, let's call it, a, $75,000, okay, that was required at the very beginning, well, then you're going to retrieve that amount at the end of the project. So that 75K would be retrieved at year five. Now, because that 75K is being retrieved, so you're getting that money back, right, is going to be a positive value, but that positive value has to be discounted all the way back to year zero, okay? So it's going to be discounted for five periods, and the present value of your recapture will be smaller, right, than the initial investment required. Now, in some cases, you may have problems like this, where it was minus $100 at year zero, $25 at year one, zero at year two, uh, minus 70, minus 70, minus 70 from year three to year five, okay? Well, in those, in those types of questions, what's important here is that I want you to understand 
that you're not just going to recapture the minus 100 that you had at the very beginning. Okay, you're not just going to recapture that. And you're also not just going to recapture the $285 that you're going to get at the end. What you're going to recapture is pretty interesting, is you're going to recapture the sum of all of those. Okay. So if you add up all of your individual change in networking capital, you'll be able to understand, you'll be able to retrieve that amount. Okay, so it's gonna be the sum of all those individual like NW, change in NWCs that you found. The reason why that's the case is because as you can notice is that, well, you had an initial investment in networking capital. In this case, it was minus hundred, but then you were able to actually have a change in networking capital that's 25 bucks what we're trying to figure out here is that you're going to recapture all of the cash, okay, that was lost into the business. But at some times, some of that cash was retrieved, and at some times, some of that cash was also um, essentially um, added. So more cash was lost into the business. And it's not just once that that cash is either being lost or retrieved. It's happening multiple times every single year, and sometimes in different amounts. And that's why we're going to add all of them up together. And what's left, either positive or negative, is what we're going to retrieve. Of course. If the, the total sum of the change in networking capital is negative, that means that there's still some money being lost in the business. And we're going to retrieve that. And this can give us a positive value. But if the sum of all the networking capital is essentially a positive, well, that's usually never going to happen. But that would mean that you'd have a negative value. But that's almost never the case. We're going to look at the normal case at which the sum of your change in networking capital is a negative amount. And that amount you're going to retrieve as a positive. It's going to be a positive value because you're not essentially retrieve all the money that was lost into the business together, all together, okay? And I guess there's another proof that we could go through is that you notice how networking capital right here increased by 185, right, total. But what's awesome here is that you see as well that, well, although it did increase by 200, 185 total, we also know that the amount is equal to 285, right? And if you add all these numbers together, I'm going to do some quick math in my head. You're going to get 210, right? Minus 70, minus 70, minus 70. Plus with this, you're going to have minus 100. I have minus 310. I'm do some quick math. And then this plus 25, you're going to get 285. And what's hilarious is that actually you're going to retrieve the last amount at the end of the project. Oh, look at that. Quick proof. Sometimes you could actually do that. I've never, I've never actually done the proof, so I'm going to have to check it out later. But still, the best practice is just to say that you're going to take the sum of all these, but it seems like you could also just take the final value of networking capital. But it's not always the case. This is a very specific example where there is no network capital prior. But anyways, just some additional context. Even me, I'm learning every single day, right? So that's pretty awesome. Anyways, that said, those are the two methods that you take. I'm more than open, I'm very open to like having a conversation about this later on though. All right, now we can move on to the salvage value. The salvage value is super straightforward. And sometimes the salvage value may not be there on an exam, right? Some easier questions may not want to burden you with that. And some harder questions will definitely want to burden you with that. But what I want you to understand is that the salvage value is essentially the cash proceeds that you'll be able to earn upon disposal termination or sale of a project. So in most of your exam questions, you're actually gonna be given like, I don't know, um, McGill University wants to open a new indoor track. And that new indoor track 10 years from now will be sold for, I don't know, $4 million. Well, that sale value at the end of the project is what we're gonna coin as being our salvage value, okay? Salvage value could also be mentioned as being residual. Oh my God, I, I don't know why I lost my words there, but the residual value, okay? Or the, term, or the terminal value or the termination value. There's a bunch of different terms that you could use here. But what I want you to really be able to understand is that this is how much money you will be getting, all right? At the end of the life of an asset or the life of a project, okay? It's the cash proceeds upon its disposal, sale or termination. That's what I want you to understand. And that this will always happen at the end of the project, okay? And because we're selling something, right? If you sell something, all right? You don't owe somebody money. If you sell something, you're getting cash. For that reason, this is a cash inflow, all right? The salvage value is always gonna be a cash inflow. Well, more often than not, not always, because you're selling something for cash. You're not selling it for a high five. You're not selling it to owe somebody money. You're selling it to earn some money, okay? And this will be generally, as I said, considered a cash inflow. It's going to be a positive value, all right? 
And yeah, this is typically a lump sum. Um, some questions could be very strange, although I've never seen it myself, but they could say that, you know what, the salvage value, you're gonna essentially receive it over several years, right, in the future. But don't expect something that crazy, although I will create a question like that because I just gave myself the idea. But really, typically the salvage value will generally consist of a lump sum at the end of the project. And because it's happening at the end of the project, that's not happening today. And we know that money received tomorrow is not as valuable as money received today. And for that reason, we're going to need to discount those cash flows. All right. If I'm talking too fast, um, I guess it's because, yes, I guess it's because the video is less than a little bit longer than I thought. And that's why I'm trying to like run through it. But what's awesome with YouTube is that you could actually like, you know, decrease my speed so I could talk slower or, you know, whatever the case may be. But as you can see here on the timeline, we have money received at T5 and we're gonna discount them, that cash flow up until T0 to find the present value. So now that we have that, we're able to move on to the last step, all right? Well, I guess not the last step, the last category. And before we go too deep within that category, I'm gonna give you some context on what it means, all right? Because we're gonna be looking at depreciation expense. And listen, depreciation expense, if you remember from your intro to financial accounting course, if you remember in the chapter for the statement of cash flows, and even be, like at the very beginning of that course, you would know that depreciation expense is a non-cash expense, right? It's not something that you're paying in cash. Let's walk through a few expenses. Expenses could be wages expense, rent expense, salaries expense, utilities expense, a, a very like a very broad set of things, interest expense. And every single one of these expenses, there's another human at the other end of that transaction, right? If you're paying wages expense, it's the company paying their employees. If you're paying rent expense, it's the company paying the landlord. If you're paying utilities expense, it's the company paying Bell, Rogers, you know, whatever the case may be. Now, depreciation expense, it's the company paying who? I hear crickets. You're not paying anybody. It's a non-cash expense. And non-cash expenses are very awesome because it allows you to understate your earnings before income tax. In simple English, non-cash expenses like depreciation expense or amort expense, it allows you to actually pay less income taxes because it's acting like you actually have less earnings than you actually do. If it's a non-cash expense, you're not paying anybody in cash. So you're understating, once again, I hope that's a very important word for you. You're understating your earnings prior to income tax on your income statement. And because of that, you're gonna be paying less taxes. And because of that, you saved some cash, right? You saved some cash. So you're able to essentially pay less on your income taxes. In other words, you're able to save cash. And that's what it's all about. And that's why that's the first entry to your adjustments to reconcile that income on your statement of cash flows, okay? So uh, once again, sorry, I hurt my wrist there, but once again, in plain English, Depreciation expense, it allows companies to pay less in income taxes, and that's going to have a positive effect to cash holdings, okay? It's going to have a very positive effect on cash holdings. And if you want more of a conversation on this, you could go look at my statement of cash flows videos on my channel, and you're going to see like an actual example, an actual uh, simulation on what it means, and hopefully it explains the topic a little bit more to you. But it's very important to understand this. All right. So now that we understand what depreciation expense is, we get to also understand that it allows us to save cash, right? Because it's understating our EBIT, our earnings before income tax. And because of that, we have a positive effect to cash holdings. And essentially that positive, that positive, that positive effect to cash holdings, that, um, that tax savings that we have there is something that within your cash flow estimation chapter, they typically like to call it as your tax shield. So how much are you being uh, sh like shielded? Is that a term? How much are you being like, you know, pushed away from your taxes, essentially? That's what a tax shield is, okay? And it can be, it can be expressed as a cash savings from paying less income tax thanks to depreciation expense, all right? And because of that, because you're paying less cash, you get uh, less taxes, you're, you're spending less cash and you're able to save more cash. And we can consider that as being a cash inflow, okay? And what's awesome is that Every single year or every single operating cycle, a company will have to pay income tax, okay? 
So what I want you to understand is that within these cash flow estimation questions, um, this tax shield, this tax savings is going to occur every single year post year zero. So year one, year two, year three, up until the end of the project, unless stated otherwise. Okay. Now, because they're occurring in the future, that tax savings, that cash savings that you have, well, it, it's not happening today. And if it's not happening today, well, it's not as valuable. So we got a discount to PV0, we got a discount to T0. So once again, this will require discounting. Now you can visualize this through our timeline right here. So you have your tax shield at year one, all the way to your tax shield at year five. And we understand that these are cash inflows in themselves. So we can discount them all the way to T0. Now, why is this relevant? Well, this is relevant because we understand that this looks just like our chapter on time value of money, where we're dealing with you know, annuities and perpetuities. In this case, assuming that this is not growing, that it's a constant amount every single year that we're saving, well, you would have a normal annuity and you just have to solve for present value. And you can do that in three ways, right? Simple. Either you use the formula, either you use the PV method on your calculator, which you just solve for PV, or you use the CF function on your calculator to solve for the, for the you know, for present value. So there's a bunch of different ways to go about this. So, <clears throat> and I'm sorry if this was long or annoying, but look at that. We were done. We are done. We just walk through the six different categories that you need to master generally for a cash flow estimation question. We walk through the initial investment, the operating cash flows, the change in networking capital, the recapture of networking capital, the, the uh, what was the what was the fifth one? Uh, the salvage value <laughs> and the tax shield. We walk through all six of these, and I feel like you should at least have a better perspective on them, at the very least. At least I hope so. And if not, please let me know because. I really want to make sure that this is an easy chapter for y'all and it's not stressful that you know how to study for it, you know, smart rather than hard. Um, so with that said, we can actually go ahead and like look at a, like a quick like, like template on how I would want you to solve these questions on an exam. Because notice how here as well, we have those six categories and they're all color coded, okay? We have our initial cash outflow, then we have our operating cash flows, working uh, our change in networking capital, our recapture, our salvage value, and our tax shield. And once we add all of them together, right, because we found the present value of every single one of them one by one, we get our net present value, okay? And our net present value, if it's positive, it means that we're going to accept the project. And if it's negative, it means that we're going to reject the project. And notice how, well, in terms of if it's a cash outflow or a cash inflow, we notice that there's only two cash outflows that we really, really need to look for, okay? That's gonna be our change networking capital and that's gonna be our initial cash outflow. So our initial investment. But every single one of the other ones, right, will be inflows. So we just need to add them, okay? Add, add, add. So I hope that makes sense because our net present value will simply be the sum of those six categories that we looked at. And with that, that's all that you need to do. You don't need to use a table. You don't need to make this a complicated setup for yourself. Just find a present value for those six categories. And by the way, on exams, you may not see all six categories. Some easier questions, some basic ones will only have two categories. Some more complicated ones may have four and comprehensive ones that touch on different chapters well, they may have six categories. But the idea now is that you know how to identify them. You understand why they matter. And you understand the consequence on a business. And you also, I guess, big picture, you're able to visualize that every single one of these categories can be visual, can be like simplified into a simple timeline. And simple timelines, we like those because that's exactly what we saw at the beginning of this course that you took, right? Within the time value of money chapter. Now we understand that we could just discount them to, to you know, T0 to, to get their present value. It's as easy as that. So now that we walked, now that we like had a, uh, I guess, a walk through, through every single one of these categories, we're going to be able to look at three different types of questions. And I'm going to show you one. Well, how do we read these questions? How do we identify the good information that we need, right? So in other words, how do we color code them? And then how do we place them within their like individual buckets and solve for the present value in order to add them together in order to find our answer? Do we accept or do we reject this project based on our MPV? So that's exactly what we're going to do now. So to make that even more simple, we're going to look at three types of questions. We're gonna look at a basic question to you know, get you warmed up. Then we're gonna look at a exam-like question, so medium size. And then we're gonna look at a very comprehensive, complex exam-like questions. So three questions for cash flow estimation 
with different levels of difficulty, with different goals. All right. So with that said, I'm going to drink a little bit of water. I'm going to jump right into it. All right, let's get into it. So <clears throat> let's begin with a very simple question, all right? Now, these are already um, highlighted because I want to be time efficient. You've already done like, I, I don't know, like an hour or something like that with me. And you're probably already annoyed and you don't want to hear my voice. That's why I took the time to just highlight them already for you. And if you want to find uh, these questions without the solutions, without the highlights, you can definitely find them in the description below or on my website. If you want different questions, you can go on my website again, and you'll be able to find more on that. So don't you worry, you're good, you're chilling. We got everything you need here. So if we, if we read this question together, we got Dunder Mifflin, and Dunder Mifflin wants to invest in a new industrial printer that will require an initial investment of $250,000 today. We know that an initial investment is something that we wanna highlight. If I was you, if I were you, I guess, on an exam is I would go ahead and pick up my blue highlighter and you're going to highlight this in blue. Why do we highlight this in blue? It's because we know that this is a, the initial investment and the initial investment is color coded in blue. So we highlight that in blue, you know that that's a cash outflow. And I almost, uh, I almost went on my screen to highlight it like this. I'm a fool. I'm going to go highlight it on the computer like a, like a normal person. That was hilarious. <clears throat> so we have this right here. I guess we'll put it in the same color. So it's actually, you know, like it actually shows like, a, like I'm being a little bit professional. So we have our first cash outflow. Now, because, sorry about that. Because this happens uh, today that we're spending 250K, this is going to be a negative value that we don't need to discount because we know this is occurring today. If we proceed throughout the question, Michael Scott expects a printer to save a hundred grand in operating costs per year for the next four years. All right. So now some bells should be ringing. We know that we're going to get 100 K for operating costs per year for the next, um, essentially that you're able to set uh, save a hundred K. All right. So that's going to be like your cash flow, your saving, your payment. That's what you're getting. Okay. You're able to save that money. If you save money, that's more money in your pockets. That's some cash. All right. It's going to be happening for four years. Then we also want you to understand is that this investment, which is what we're going to highlight in yellow, all right, is going to be fully depreciated over the life, on, over its life on a straight line basis. So if it's being depreciated over the life of the project, we know that we're going to be able to depreciate 250K over four years. So you're going to do 250K divided by four. That's going to give you your depreciation expense for every single year. And once you have your depreciation expense for every single year, you're going to be able to multiply that by the corporate tax rate, which is 25%, in order to find what your tax shield will be. How much are you saving thanks to depreciation? How much are you get, gaining as a tax shield? And then you have a bunch of little jazz, blah, blah, blah. And they want to let you know as well that your cost of capital trends towards 10.5%. And within all of that information that was provided, we want you to determine whether Dunder Mifflin should implement or reject this project. Okay? So, a few things before we begin, all right? What I want you to be able to understand is that because we only color-coded three things that we saw previously, which is our initial investment, our operating cash flows, and our tax shield, well, we only need to solve for three in, like different things. We don't need to solve, for example, for our networking capital recapture, because here that's not what we have. So already there, you have some clarity on what has to be done. So we're only, we're only gonna have to solve for this and this, and this. Okay. Now, of course, the present value of your initial cash outflow, the present value of your initial investment is going to be equal to itself. Money that you receive today, well, that's the present value. All right. So that's already a walk in the park. So we can go ahead and like maybe put like a checkbox next to every single one of these. So this is light work. If we move on to the operating cash flows, well, the operating cash flows, well, we could kind of, once again, we understand that this is all, you know, time value of money. We could try to put them into a framework. So we know that we're receiving hundred grand every single year for four years. So let's go ahead and go on the next page and let's try to like visualize that. So as you can see here, we could go ahead and kind of like visualize it on this Excel manner or simply by just using a timeline like, like this. You know, you have payments happening at every single year, except year zero. 
and you know that they're equal to 100k, right? However, if I'm being, okay, however, these 100 grand, this like these individual payments of 100k, well, they're going to be subject to taxes, okay? So you need to essentially do minus 25k every single year. Now, what's awesome is that you could simply do sales minus cost times one minus the tax rate, and that's gonna give you the same amount because you would have 100 grand times essentially one minus 0.25% or 0.25, sorry, and that would give you 0.75. That's gonna give you 75K as your payment for year one. It's really as easy as that. So that would be the first step in defining your operating cash flows, right? And we understand that your operating cash flows, well, they're gonna be constant every single year. They're gonna be the same amount throughout, okay? Such that for you to find a present value, there's a few ways of going about this. You could either, <clears throat> as you can see here, so I'll highlight them in red. I'm sorry that I'm losing, losing my voice a little bit. I'm actually really excited. So I'm maybe a little bit more calm along the way, but smiles, I'm excited for you. You're understanding things. There's three ways, I guess, that we could go about this, even maybe four. The first way, would, the most, I guess, foolish way would be to do the simple discounting method at which you would do payment one over one plus K to the power of one, then payment two over one plus K to the power of two. And then you would add them up together, right? That would be the first method of going about it. Not the best way. The second way of going about it that I could think of is using the normal annuity formula. The reason why we know we could use a normal annuity formula is because we're dealing with we're dealing with a defined timeline, right? Four years, at which we know that these payments are happening at the end of the year. And then we know that these payments are constant, okay? So we're dealing with a normal annuity, such that we could use a normal annuity formula to solve, right? If we know that our K is 10%, if that's still correct, our K is 10.5%, so that's just me that didn't give the, the rounding thing, but we know that K is 10.5%. We know that our payment effectively, right? After our after tax cash flow is a 75K, we know this is occurring for four years. So we could go ahead and plug this into our formula and solve <clears throat> for our normal annuity, for our normal annuity's present value. That's one way of going about it as well. Another way of going about it is by plugging this in within your calculator. Now there's two ways to plug this in within your calculator, all right? So I'll go at C. And the two ways of doing this is by either just simply plugging in your, your IY, right? as being equal to 10.5%, your N as being equal to four, your payment as being 75,000, and essentially the future value is equal to zero, and you would compute for the present value, right? You would do that, compute for present value. Like if you were looking at a hypothetical or a loan, right? Or you could use the CF function in which you would have CO1 as being equal to 75K, and you would have FO1 as being equal to four, and then, of course, CF0, by the way, in this case, we're going to set it to zero because we just want to know the present value of this right here. But, you know, technically, you could add the initial investment, but then you would just need to look at another part. It's, it's all up to you. But with that, you would put your I as being equal to 10.5%, and then you would do compute NPV. That's one way of going about it as well. The idea is here is that all paths lead to Rome. And you could choose a method that works best for you. But it's really important to be able to understand if we look back at our prompt, that they told you something that looked a little bit complicated at first. Michael Scott expects the printer to save 100 grand in operating costs per year for the next four years. Oh my God, what do we do? Don't worry about it. Use a timeline, visualize the cash flows. Okay, year 100K, year 200K, year 300K, year 400K. Amazing. We know that that's our payment. That's super cool. You understand that. Well, if we know that's our payment and we know N is four and we know our cost of capital and we know there's no G and we know that we're looking at time value of money, we could just plug that in within our formula. Or if that's too much for us, we could go ahead and just plug it in within our calculator. There's a bunch of different ways to solve for this in an actual like easy manner, okay? So that's how you get your value for your present value of operating cash flows of B to be essentially 235,189.
It's really, really, really important to understand though that our operating cash flows formula, it's sales minus cost times one minus the tax rate. You need to get through that hurdle first. Once you have that, you're able to just identify payment one and then just run with it or all your payments. Sorry about that. <clears throat> My voice is a little bit rocked. So I'm trying to you know, run with it with y'all. So now that we have that, okay, we're good. We can move on to the tax shield. So I'll go ahead and I'm gonna use a, I'm gonna use my yellow here. So the tax shield, how do we go about the tax shield? Well, let's kind of read the question real quick once again. In this case, they're telling you, hey friend, this entire asset, this entire project or printer, well, it's gonna be fully depreciated over its life. And what does that mean for you? If something is being fully depreciated throughout its useful life, it means that the residual value is equal to zero, okay? And it means that every single year, you're gonna lose a portion of 250 grand, right? Over four years. So to find your depreciation expense here, you do 250 divided by four. And if I could do some quick math, I'm gonna say that that's 62,500. That's gonna be your depreciation expense every single year. All right, so let's go ahead and look at what I wrote as your basic solutions here. So yeah, you're gonna have your depreciation expense, okay? And that's gonna be 62.5K every single year. That's awesome stuff. But we understand that our tax shield is equal to that amount times the tax rate. And if our tax rate here is 25%, so this is no bueno, we know that 25% times 62,500, I'm gonna just make sure that it's actually correct so I don't have to make an adjustment. We know that that's equal to 15.625K. So this will be our tax shield every single year. So technically you're saving in taxes $15,625 every single year. You can even build a timeline if you want to. It's really up to you. Like that's totally fine. Right? And you have this as being one, two, three, four. You would have a tax shield of $15,625 every single year. But the thing is, those cash flows, they're not happening today. They're happening in the future. And because the tax shield is occurring in the future, you need to discount it all the way back to t equals zero. All right? Now, in order to do so, it's kind of like what we discussed in the previous section for the OCFs. You could use a bunch of methods, right? You could use the simple discounting formula, which would be the sum of these individual payments over one plus K to the power of I, you could do that. Or you could use the formula for a normal annuity. It's really up to you. They're both fine. Or you could use your calculator. Now your calculator, within your calculator, I guess, you could use one or two methods. You could either use um, the PV method or you could use the, I guess we'll call it the compute PV method. Or you could use the compute NPV method. So I guess we'll call it compute. We'll do CF plus compute NPV method. So realistically, there are four methods that you could go for. Okay, go with the one that works best for you. This is literally a tie. I really hope that this is clear. This is once again just a timeline. Okay, we're we're looking at chapter five if you're at JMSB. We're looking at time value of money if you're at any other school at which we're building a timeline and then we're discounting the cash flows. I may even, I'm pretty sure I have a few videos on this, but I may even create some dedicated how to discount cash flows video, just such that it's very, 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 very clear, okay? So now you get your present value for your tax shield. Hooray, hurrah, we're so happy. So what's awesome here is that there's nothing else that you need to do, right? Because this question only has three categories. It talked about the initial investment, it talked about the operating cash flows, and it talked about the tax shield. Once you have these three values, it's a walk in the park. You're gonna do A plus B plus C, and that's gonna give you your NPV. In this case, your NPV is greater than your initial, I mean, your value, right? If you add the every, anyways, make it simple. Your NPV is bigger than zero. And because your NPV is bigger than zero, you got an accept decision. Michael Scott should accept this decision. And Pam and Jim are going to be extremely happy as long, along, along with Dwight. So that's how you go about it. <clears throat> that's how you solve a very simple question. 
And it's just to give you some perspective on what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Okay. Now it's a walk in the park. I know that it's not complicated. It's just meant to give you an introduction to what cash flow estimation is all about. Now we're gonna move on to an exam-like question, a literal final exam-like question, but that's not totally comprehensive. That's not drawing upon stuff from bond valuation or equity valuation or the WAC chapter. They're still gonna give you a cost of capital. They're still gonna give you some normal amounts, all right? But I still wanna make sure that you're able to walk through it. So let's go ahead and find one of these questions together. Notice that this one is a short question, but it touches on all the topics, but I'm gonna let you kind of look at it afterwards. I wanna take one that's a little bit more complicated because I want you to be a pro. Give me a sec, I'll get just that. That's a medium sized one. Okay, this is a medium sized one and it's a good one. All right, so we're gonna read through it together. And of course, everything's already identified. I'm just trying to save on time. But the steps, the actual calculations, we're going to do them together because it's extremely valuable. OK, so this is a medium sized questions question on cash flow estimation. All right. This is something that you may see on a final exam. It's something that you may see on an assessment. And to be completely fair with you, if you are a finance major, you will see this in other classes. So this is an amazing introduction to the topic. Let's go about it together. Just gonna get some water. I'm like at the second hour, I think, or maybe I'm just crazy. I'm only an hour in. I don't know. My voice, it's cracked. I don't know why. I guess allergies or something. All right. <clears throat> Gotta do a little stretch, get into it. So, Shy Designs wants to open a new office in New York. Now, the project will require an initial investment of $1.15 million, i.e. today. If you are reading an exam, or if you're reading a question on an exam, or if you're just practicing, sorry, I want you to highlight this in blue, okay? Because we know that this is the initial investment. That's something that's occurring. That's one of the six categories that we care about. So you're going to go ahead and highlight that in blue. And what's awesome here is that because we know that this is occurring today, this is the initial investment, the present value of something happening today is equal to itself. So we could go ahead and put a little like mark here, a check mark, to say that we know that this is okay. We don't need to make any adjustments. We got the first category down. I'm sorry if my, my throat's all, all messed up. But let's go on to the next, the next step. I'm going to highlight this in red. So the Dubai office, I mean, this is a New York office, I guess. I'm a little bit cracked when I made the question, but my bad. The New York office will generate revenues of $425,000 at the end of year one, okay? And cash flows are expected to grow by 9% per year until the end of the project in year five. So notice how this sounds a little bit like our questions from time value of money, right? We have this cash flow at year one, so we could call this like payment one. And we know that it's growing by 9%, so we have our G. Like this is getting very similar to what we know, right? And it's payment one all the way to payment five, okay? But they're also letting you know, hey, by the way, the CEO expects the operating costs to be only 20% of revenues, all right? So if our revenues, right? If, there are, if they are like, you know, $425,000 a year one, but we know that the, our revenues are increasing, well, by definition, if our costs are a function of our revenues, well, our costs will also be increasing, okay? So if you remember what we talked about at the beginning of this video, you understand that well, when we're dealing with stuff like this, when we're dealing with growing payments, i.e. a growing annuity, you know that it's better to just use the formula, make this easier for you, okay? The best method. The calculator won't help you. The simple discounting method won't help you. It's just going to be way too long when dealing with a question like this. Hopefully, you will use my recommendation. All right? And they're also letting you know, by the way, highlighted in red here as well, but eh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. So <clears throat> also, the project will require an immediate 75K increase in networking capital. Now, if you recall what we discussed previously as well, an immediate like investment in networking capital 
this essentially indicates that this is NWC at year zero, okay? NWC zero, all right? Now, I'm just gonna check if I have an adjustment to make. It, it doesn't say it in this question, but we're gonna assume that there's a recapture, okay? I didn't make, uh, I didn't write it, but we're gonna assume there's also a recapture, so I'll write this in orange, um, plus recapture at the end of the project, okay? So it's gonna be even more comprehensive. So that's awesome. So we have that, so that's really cool. We understand that at NWC, so I just said year zero, we're gonna invest 75K. And because we know 75K is gonna be invested today, well, we already know what we need to plug in here. The present value of our networking capital is gonna be equal to 75K. The reason why it's equal to 75K, it's because we know that there's only one investment in networking capital, nothing else. It's always gonna be 75 grand, all right? So the reason why I'm kind of working as we're doing the question is because some of these categories, they don't require heavy lifting. Some of these categories, I would want you to be able to quickly find them on the exam. Like, yo, listen, the initial investment and the immediate investment into NWC, well, that's light work. We just got to remember that they're negative. That's it. So another thing that's important now is we can walk through, I guess, or walk towards, what am I saying? We could do the idea here is that this office in New York for Shy Designs was going to be fully depreciated. Okay, it's going to be fully depreciated such that there will be no residual value. And if there's no residual value, this means that our $1.15 million is going to be essentially depreciated in, the, in, the, in its like entirety every single year for those five years. So to find a depreciation expense, you're going to have to do $1.15 million divided by five. Sorry for the power outside. So that's another portion that we're going to need to work on. And then they're also letting you know that your corporate tax rate is 45%. So that's important because we're going to be able to solve for our actual OCFs with that. And that's pretty much all that we're going to work with for now. So we have all that information. So what's important here, sorry if my voice is cracking, uh, I, I'm trying hard. We know that we need this to be done. So we need to solve for the present value of our operating cash flows. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, my voice. We know that we have our networking capital recapture that we need to work for. We know that because this project is being fully depreciated, we understand that, yo, man, you don't have any salvage value to look into. So really, if you were on an exam and you had this on your cheat sheet, like the, the methodology to follow through, you would go ahead and say, well, this is also done, okay? And then you would notice that, all right, there's only the tax shield also to solve for it. So the reason, and my gosh, there's so many typos in my stuff right now. This is crazy. This is going to be a reject, but whatever, we'll write that word. But the reason why this is awesome is because you notice that at the very beginning of this video, I talked about six categories, six different things that you had to walk through on an exam. You probably felt like that was overwhelming. But what's awesome here is that you notice that, yo, you know what? More often than not, I only got three things to calculate for. The OCF, the networking capital recapture, which is like a walk in the park, and then the tax shield, which maybe requires two steps, but also mad easy, like these are free points. So you notice how a six category type of question becomes a maybe call it like six manipulations that you need to do in like 10 seconds each. It's a walk in the park. That's what I'm trying to say. So hopefully this helps you kind of put it in perspective. So let's go ahead and walk through this portion here, the operating cash flows. How do we make sense of them? So of course I have the solutions here, but what I want to be able to do with you is we're going to just draw our timeline together. Okay. And we're going to try to make sense of this. So I'll go ahead and I'll draw it up here. And you'll see what I mean in just a second. So year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. All right. But we know that operating cash flows, as you can see here, it's a function of sales less costs, right? Once you have that amount, which is gonna be your earnings before, I guess your EBIT, you're gonna multiply that by one minus the tax rate. But in this exam, you won't have Excel. In this exam, you won't have a lot of time. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna just be, you're gonna work smart. What you're gonna do is you're actually gonna understand that, yo, because we know that we're dealing with a simple and growing annuity, 
we can simply do this. So we know we have payment one. And we know we have payment two, payment three, payment four, and payment five. And we also know, just to be quick, you know, you're one. Okay. So we have our 425K. And we know that we have 425K right here. Like if you are an exam, that's how I would look at it. And we know that that amount is growing by G every single year, right? It's growing by G. And we understand that plugging this in within our formula, would, within our calculator would suck. So what we could do is we could say, well, you know what? Let me find payment one. And let me just add in, or in other words, let me find OCF1. And then let me just plug that in within my growing annuity formula. So what you would do is you would simply do, okay, well, I know my sales is equal to 425K. So this is gonna be sales. And I know that my costs, well, if I go back to my question, it's 20% of revenues. So what I could do is I could do this times 0.2, and it's going to give me my cost. Or I could also find, you know what? Sales minus cost will simply be equal to 425 multiplied by 1 minus 0 0.2. Yeah, 0 0.2. Because typically, if 20% of your sales is going to be your cost, well, you could just say, you know what? Buck all that. I'm just going to do 425 times 0 0.8 so I can get my value to get sales minus cost. And then you're going to take your sales minus cost and you're going to multiply it by one minus your tax rate. In this case, your tax rate, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, is 45%. So really what you're going to have, and I'm sorry that my solutions are kind of all over the place, you're going to have 425 times 0 0.8. That amount is going to be multiplied by 0 0.55 and that's going to give you $187,000 okay and that will be OCF1 or in other words payment one okay now once you have that you can go ahead and plug that in with your formula which I'm going to highlight right here okay so to find the present value of a growing annuity all that you have to do is your payment one over K minus G. I'm pretty sure I'm doing this correct. Minus one G over one plus K power of N. So what you would do is you just plug all of that stuff in. And the reason why this is interesting is because you know what your payment is. You know that in this case, your K is equal to 14%. You know that your G is nine. You know that your N is five. So just like that, you're able to solve for the present value in seconds. And you would notice that the present value is equal to 751,317.12. Now, I tried to walk through this with you just because I guess I wanted to make it really like clear that this is exactly what we were doing when we were looking at our stuff for, um, for, uh, for the time value of money chapter. Sorry, I was just making sure the recording was still working. Imagine I was talking for two hours and a half or whatever and I was talking to my wall, I don't even know what I would do. I'd be upset though. So that said, we, uh, we got our value for our, for our operating cash flows and it was really, really easy. But I will take a quick step back. I really want you to remember that one, this is a timeline. So we're dealing with time value of money. It's easy to solve for the present value. Two, I need you to recall that you have to do sales less cost times one minus the tax rate, okay? And however you wanna to get to your operating cash flows for year one, by all means. But just please remember that you need to make those little adjustments, that you need to do those manipulations. It's very important, okay? So with that, you're able to solve for 751,317. I'm not gonna plug that in within my formula right now. There's no chance. But now that you have that, all that you gotta do now is solve for the networking capital recapture. So, well, not all that you have to do. The next step is to do that. For the networking capital recapture, it's pretty straightforward. So by the way, notice how I gave you the section here for NWC, but it's really minus 75K. It's, but it goes back to the rule that we mentioned earlier, okay? Not gonna spend too much time on that. It's walking apart. 
But for our networking capital recapture, we know that we had 75K that was lost in the business up until the end of the project, up until year five. So at year five, you're gonna be able to recapture that 75 grand, right? That 75K that was lost in the business, that was trapped in the business, okay? So lost in the project, we'll write that. However, you're not retrieving 75K at year zero. You're retrieving 75K at year five, okay? And because we understand that money received tomorrow is not the same as money that we received today, I much rather receive money today. If you told me I'm a millionaire in a thousand years, I don't care about that. I care about maybe today, let's talk about today. So all jokes aside, there are a few ways to solve for this. And it's very similar to what we've mentioned earlier. So you could go ahead and use a simple discounting method, which is very, very, very easy. You don't even need to do a sum. It's simply gonna be your payment at year five over one plus K to the power of five. So that's one way to go about it. You could also go ahead and use your, I mean, nah, I would, yeah, that's also probably the, the best way to go about it. You could compute for the present value on your calculator, or you could use the CF function plus compute for MPV on your, on your calculator as well. If you're gonna use the CF function, just please put CO1 as zero, CO2 as zero, CO3 as zero, CO4 as zero, and then CO5, you could put it at 75K. And of course, CF zero would be zero as well. So I guess I'll write this here. CO5 will be equal to 75K. CF zero, all the way to CO5, I mean, sorry, CO4, will be equal to zero. I hope that makes sense. And then that's gonna give you the present value of that recapture, the money you retrieved at year five as being $38,000. That's super cool, okay? So just like that, you were able to solve for you know, your recapture. And how I would go about it, maybe even if I were you, is I would have like a checkbox, right? You have all of them, you identify them on your, on your paper while you're on the exam, or especially when you're studying. And then if, it's, if there's nothing, you just put zero. And then you just add your values there one by one. And then you just get to sum them up together. That's how I would do it. Like what I'm doing now. I have all of our different categories and I'm going to them one by one and I'm checkboxing them, every single one of them, checking them up. Okay, we got that, we got that, we got that. That's how I would go about it. Now for the tax shield. This is the second time we're walking through the tax shield, okay? And it should get a little bit simpler for you. So in this question, we understand that our assets value is one point is $1.15 million, okay? But that asset is gonna be fully depreciated. In other words, there's no residual value. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna do 1.15 million divided by five. Now I'm not gonna to try to do some quick maths on that. I'm gonna say that, uh, I don't even know. I think it's like 230K. I'm gonna go with 230K, that's gonna be our number. Hey, look at that, hey, I'm not bad, huh? I took a lot of time to get the answer. I'm not gonna lie, that was a little bit too long, but I'm okay with that. So our depreciation expense, because we know our initial investment is 1.15, our salvage value is zero, such that the total amount that can be depreciated over those five years will be equal to 1.15, such that our depreciation expense every single year is gonna be equal to 230K, but we don't care about the depreciation expense. We care about the tax shield. How do you find a tax shield? Simple, you're gonna do $230,000 times 0 0.45 in this case, I can't do math like that. It's gonna be like $120,000, something like that. No, see, I was good with the other math. I wasn't good with this one. And the reason why I messed it up and I'm gonna let you know is because I did time 0 0.55 in my head, not time 0 0.45. I forgot what the tax rate was. So I'm not that much of a fool I'm trying to flex my, my, my mental math muscles. So we know that our tax shield because our, it's gonna be the same every year because we understand that and it's gonna occur for five years. We understand that, well, of course they won't, you know, money received tomorrow won't be the same as money received today. So we got to discount every single one of them, all right? And to find the present value of the tax shield. And there's a few ways they could go ahead uh, to do this. Now, once again, this, it's always the same thing. You could use the sum of your payments over one plus K to the power of I. So you would discount this one individual, I mean, this one individual, this one individually, blah, blah, blah. Or you could go ahead and use your normal annuity formula because these are K 
cash flows that are occurring for a definite amount of time and they're constant and they're occurring at the end of the year. So you could go ahead and plug that in within your formula at which you know that this would be your payment. Phi would be your N. K would be the one that was provided. It's your cost of capital. And G would be equal to zero. There's no G. And you would solve for the present value. Or you could use your calculator. Within your calculator, you could use two methods. You could use the compute for present value method. Or you could use a compute, uh, sorry, the CF plus compute and PV method. Very straightforward. They listen, as I always say, all paths lead to Rome. Because of that, it, you can choose whatever works best for you. And boom, just like that, you get the present value of your tax yield. Very straightforward. All right. By the way, um, I always say this in my videos. If you feel like I made a mistake, let me know. Always happy to help. Always happy to make an adjustment. That's why I'm here. All right. So let's go on and let's kind of just do a quick checkbox. Check box. So now you have all of your values. Okay. Once again, I want you to understand that the present value of the initial cash investment and of the networking capital, <clears throat> well, we didn't need to do anything because we know that those cash flows occurred at year zero. So we don't need to discount them such that we only had three manipulations to do. The one for the operating cash flows and the one for the networking capital recapture and the tax shield. Now you have all of your values. It's easy. You just add them up together. And in this case, you get minus 79,406.35. And because of that, because our NPV is smaller than zero, we have a reject decision. So you would go to the CEO. You say, listen, chief, mm -mm -mm. this ain't it. This is not the project. Maybe we should go somewhere else. And just like that, you know how to solve a actual exam-like question. Notice how it's really not that hard, like realistically. Two of the steps are free. Three of the other steps, they're not hard. As long as you practice, you'll be able to do this in a breeze. Like I actually think that this is a question that you could solve in less than two minutes and a half, maybe three minutes. It's very straightforward, okay? Because once again, all of them you could plug in within your formula. It's always a question of, find, of finding the first year's payment. That I could understand is like slightly difficult, but the rest is straightforward, okay? Not even difficult, just it takes time, all right? But now, ooh, now it's time for the big guns, all right? It's time to, to get hard with it, okay? Because we're gonna do a comprehensive exam question. One that requires several steps. More steps than you would wish that you could deal with. But although rare nowadays, if you're at Concordia, because uh, most questions or most exams will be multiple choice, and they like to you know, cram a bunch of questions in the exam. So I doubt that you're ever gonna deal with something that big, but on a project, on an assessment and in classes that are past an intro to finance class, you may see this. However, students at UPenn, students at McGill, students at uh, the Ivy School of Business, you may see this, okay? Depending on the nature of your course. So nonetheless, this will serve as a really, really good like final exam comprehensive review because it touches on all the chapters. And yeah, it, it'll help you out no matter what. So let's walk through that. We're gonna drink a little bit of water and you'll see how easy this is for y'all, all right? Oh man. Right now it's so beautiful outside. And I'm out here inside teaching, giving you the knowledge. How cringe that sounds. I'm, 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 I must be cringe right now. But all jokes aside, it's really nice outside. So I should go play some basketball or something. Anyways, let's move on to the <clears throat> comprehensive exam, like cracked out of its mind question that we're going to do here. All right, so let me find one real quick. That requires several steps. All right, this one is, this one is, this one's, this one's crazy a little bit. So notice how there's a lot of steps here. We're going to walk through this question together. You're going to become an absolute pro. And in this comprehensive cash flow estimation question, we're going to be touching on several chapters. We're going to be looking at, of course, cash flow estimation. We're going to look at bond valuation, equity valuation. Then we're also going to be looking at WAC, all right, in order to find the cost of capital. And of course, we're always going to touch on some time value of money because really, this chapter really, really is a, you know, a derivative of the time value of money chapter. 
So let's go ahead and walk through this step by step. In this case, we're gonna try to identify as we're walking through the question, all of the important stuff, all of the hard stuff. And then you'll see how really something that looks really complicated could be very easy for us. Okay, so let's go, let's do this together. <clears throat> Amaze Telecom wants to enter Canada's wireless data services market in order to compete with companies like Telus, Rogers, and Bell. This doesn't matter to you. If you read a question and you see this, you don't care. This is all fluff. It literally means nothing. So if I were you, I would go ahead and like scratch that out. You don't even want to draw your eyes to this. However, the CEO does believe that the company, right, could generate 500 annual phone subscriptions this year, okay? And the CEO, well, she believes that this figure could grow by 4.5% per year, all right? Already there, some, uh, some bells should be ringing, okay? Because they're telling you that, hey, you have 500K of phone subscriptions that you expect to make this year, but you expect that number to grow by 4.5% per year. Now, what are we looking at when we're highlighting stuff in red? We're looking at our operating cash flows. We know that our operating cash flows is sales minus cost times one minus the tax rate. But what is sales? Sales is a function of the number of clients you have. So that number that we just highlighted here, 500K uh, phone subscriptions and 4.5% uh, gross per year, well, that's extremely relevant because it's going to be a factor of our sales. So we need to keep that in mind. And they also let you know that, yo, this project is going to finish at year six. So that's awesome. They're also letting you know that the annual phone subscription subscription generate $350 to the firm. So they're telling you here that one individual customer that they're able to sign or get, well, that's going to give us essentially a cost of $350. Well, actually, no, it's going to generate, sorry, this is our revenues, $350 per individual. But they also let you know that one individual is going to cost approximately $315 to acquire. So if you remember what we talked about at the beginning of this webinar, we said that when you have variable costs, it's probably a good idea to maybe mix that together with our essentially our like how much money we're making per client. Okay, I'm going to continue and kind of just read through the question and then we're going to highlight stuff and make it easier for us just because it is comprehensive. I don't want to get us lost throughout the way. They're also letting you know that the initial investment that is required here <clears throat> is $40 million. So we could go ahead and say that this is C of zero. All right, so we have an initial investment of 40 mil. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and write anything. Wait, this should ring a bell too, all right? And your fixed overhead cost, well, that's going to be essentially $3.25 million per year. All right, so once again, notice how we have variable costs and notice how we have fixed costs. What's awesome in this question as well is that they're letting you know that this endeavor could be salvaged for $15 million, okay? So at the end of the project, this will be salvaged for 50, 15, sorry, million dollars. Moving forward, they're also letting you know that this will be depreciated using a straight line method. But now this is different, okay? I want you to understand that if you do have a salvage value, that means that you expect to sell this project or whatever for a specific amount at the end of the project. So when you're looking at depreciation, well, depreciation is an accounting method to account for the loss in value of an asset, but only for how much value it loses. In this case, we're not telling you, yo, from that $40 million, you're gonna lose all of that value. No, we're telling you that you're gonna lose essentially 40 million minus $15 million worth of value. So you're gonna lose $25 million worth of value for this project, essentially. That's one way to look at it until the end of the, pro until the, end of the project. So when we're trying to figure out what's our depreciation, we're gonna do 25 million, divided by six, because that's a difference between the project, uh, between you know the initial investment and its salvage value and its residual value, okay? So 25 divided by six. I don't think I'll be able to do the same beautiful mental math, but I'll say, I don't know, uh, 4.167, that's my bet. Does that make sense? Let's look at it now. Uh, I need a dopamine. Oh, that's correct. Yes, 4.1, hey, look at that. I'm, I'm doing crazy for math right now. Anywho, so just some, some cues there. Then they're telling you that note that the board of directors requires, okay, or they required 
a 250K search study from the consulting company KVA in order to analyze whether this project was viable before approving the investment. Now, this for us does not matter. The reason why this does not matter is because this is what we call, or this is what we define as being a sunk cost. A sunk cost is something that you're, you're gonna have to pay no matter what happens with the project. If you accept the project or if you reject the project, you still pay 250K for the research study. Okay, so for that reason, that cost this should not have an impact on the cash flows, on the NPV of the project, all right? That's what we mentioned as being a sunk cost, all right? It doesn't matter, you don't care about that. So now we can go ahead and read the following point, at which we're telling you that the board of directors, well, they also mentioned that the project will require the following investments in networking capital. $2.5 million today. All right, that's interesting. And what do we know about NWC zero? NWC zero or a change in NWC zero, it's always negative, All right? So remember that. But in this case, when we're looking at the total change in networking capital, well, unfortunately there's multiple years, right? We have 450K at year one, 320K from year two to year five, and then 520K at year six. So when we're calculating our change in networking capital, because we want to know how much money is being retrieved from the current operations of the business or how much money has been added, so lost to the current operations of the business, we're going to need to create a little table or just like tabulate the data to make sense of this for us, to really find the effect of cash. So it's not as simple as the previous questions we did, at which we just added, you know, NWC for year zero. No, in this case, we're going to have to look at the change in NWC for every single year, okay? Now, it's also safe to assume that the total change in networking capital, so the sum of all the change in networking capital, is going to be recaptured at the end of the project. Okay, that's pretty important. Now, that's a simple little piece of math that we're going to do afterwards, but not, a, not an issue. So here's where the, the stuff gets cracked. Okay, this is a portion of bond valuation and equity valuation in order to find WAC. So we're touching on three chapters here. All right. So nine years ago, Amaze Telecom issued 250,000 15 year semi annual coupon bonds, okay, with a face value of $1,000 to fund their activities. And we're letting you know that the bond is currently trading at par, while it pays a coupon of $47.5 every six months. So before we proceed, just a few things. We know that we're going to look at this in order to solve for WAC. So we could go ahead. And I'll make this clear for you. We're, we're going to look at these two buckets, these two bullet points, in order to solve for WAC. And the reason why we're doing, we're looking for WAC is because you'll notice at the bottom that they didn't give you a cost of capital. So these two bullet points are made for you to solve for the cost of capital of the firm. And we're going to do that using the WAC formula. So the WAC formula, it's important because we need to find a few things. You need to find the cost of equity, the cost of debt, the market value of debt, and the market value of equity. And with that, you're going to be able to solve for the cost of capital. In this case here, they're giving you essentially, the, they're giving you an opportunity to solve for the actual market value. So I'll highlight it here really quickly, just with the number of bonds and the face value of a bond. And if they're trading at par, well, you know that you just do 250K times a thousand. But then they're also giving you, well, they're going to allow you to find the, essentially the yield to market. And how would you find the yield to market here? Well, we'll look at that later, but it really does touch upon this notion of the coupon payment that they discussed here, all right? Same thing applies with the second bullet point at which you're letting you know that the common stock of Amaze Telecom is essentially trading at $245 per year, and we have a 1.75 million shares outstanding. With that, you're gonna be able to find the market value of equity, okay? But they're also giving you, because they're, they're weirdos, they're letting you know that it has a beta of 1.45, um, that the standard deviation on the market portfolio is equal to 14.5%, and the returns on the market portfolio is equal to 8.82, while the risk-free rate is 3.95. Well, that should be ringing some bells for y'all, because that means that we need to use CAPM to find the cost of equity. So it really does touch on a lot of things here. Like, we're talking about a lot of stuff, and that's why we're really going to go through this question step by step, Okay. So another thing that they're asking is that they're letting you know is that the marginal tax rate is 28%. So that's our TC. 
And they're also letting you know that, yo, do we accept or reject this project? So we're gonna go ahead and make this easy for us. There's one thing that we wanna just highlight from the very beginning, and that is the initial investment. It's the first thing that we know we could do and that we shouldn't have any like qualms of doing. So we have the values here, but these values mean nothing to you because you don't know how to get to them yet. So we're gonna to get to them together. So we know first step is I would probably just say the PV of you know our initial cash outflow. Well, that's obviously, oh, uh oh, is this the, huh. did I get the right solution? Hold up, uh, give me a sec. I may have gotten the wrong solution. Let me see. Huh, this may be the wrong solution box. So give me a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause the share because I may I may have taken the wrong question box, like the wrong solution for myself. So I'm gonna pause the share. Um, I'll be back in five seconds. Okay, so we could actually jump right into it. And it turns out that I think I'm gonna leave our initial investment as $70 million. Now I made this question, like it's like I make it, so I kind of have the opportunity to choose how I want it to go. And just to make this more interactive, more fun, we're gonna leave it at $70 million. So we're gonna go ahead and write the present value of our initial investment as being 70 mil. Okay, let's go with that. That said though, still, it doesn't change the fact that the first step remains, you know, assuming no, no errors <laughs> from your teachers or whatever on the exam, it remains something that's pretty straightforward. You find that it's equal to $70 million and that's it. Now, the next step is going to be for us to solve for our operating cash flows. Our operating cash flows is where the magic happens. It's typically the first thing that students don't tend to love, but we're going to really going to walk through this right now. We're going to make sense of it together. Now, before we proceed, I guess I'm going to just, uh, no, we'll use the solution box. Actually, we'll even do something else. If you want to solve for your operating cash flows, right? You're going to find, you know, your OCF for year one, and then plug that in because there's a growth rate here. We're going to need to use a growing annuity formula. But the thing is within a growing annuity formula, and the more questions you do, the more you'll realize that this would be your first step is that you need to find, you need K for your growing annuity formula. But the thing is we don't have our K because K is going to be our cost of capital. And since we don't have our cost of capital, we need to solve for whack. And they gave us a bunch of information below in order for us to do so. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and solve for WAC together. I'm going to really walk you through the steps and make sense of them. Of course, I already have the solutions. Of course, I don't want to make this like a 10 hour video, but you're going to see like, why are we doing some steps? And hopefully it'll make something that have been more like something static. It would make, it's going to make it a little bit more fun and interactive for you. So let's go ahead and do it. So the first part in order for us to solve for WAC, I always like to go with the easy stuff. And that's going to be to solve for the cost of equity. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. We're going to walk through it together. I'm going to assume that you remember the material. You have it on paper that you're not just watching this because just watching this will do nothing for you. But let's go ahead and remember that for us to solve for the cost of equity. Well, we're going to use the simple, you know, cap M formula, right? We're going to use our good old friend K is equal to the risk free rate plus beta times ERM minus the risk-free rate. So I guess I'll, uh, no, it's whatever. We'll leave it like that. So that's going to be our formula. That's our cap M formula. That's how we're going to solve for our cost of equity. Well, in this case, we know that our cost of equity is equal to 3.95%, right? It's not a problem. I mean, sorry, our risk-free rate is equal to 3.95%. If we read the question, yes, it is exactly that. We know that our beta is 1.45. That's what was provided within the question. We know that our ERM is 8.82. And with that, we could go ahead. I'm just making sure that all of my data is correct because I don't want to make a mistake for y'all. But if there's a mistake, you know, you'll let me know. Cool. So we have all the good stuff. Awesome. And with that, we're able to solve for the cost of equity. And it's going to be equal to 11.01%. Now, if I do some quick math, I don't know if I want to do some quick math in my head right now. But it should be equal to something like that. It should be that. I believe it's that. So that's our cost of equity. And the reason why we need our cost of equity, and I'll make it extremely clear for y'all, is because we know that the WAC formula is equal to equity value over the total value of the firm times the cost of equity plus debt value 
times the cost of debt. I guess I'll do this times the cost of debt times one minus the tax rate. Okay, so just now we were able to solve. So I'll put this on yellow. We were able to solve for the cost of equity. The next step now is to solve for the cost of debt. I like to go through steps, step by step, and make this easier for myself. The cost of debt, what I want you to remember, and that's something that you're going to need to apply within your WAC chapter, right? Or assuming you already did WAC, that's why you're doing this with me now, is that in this question, if we zoom out a little bit, I'll highlight it in yellow, they told us that <clears throat> the company, right, Amaze Telecom, well, it pays, right, semi-annual coupon bonds, okay? Such that, essentially, it's making payments every six months, right? There are two payments per year, such that we could actually find our cost of debt by just doing a little tour de passe passe, okay? So how would you find the cost of debt? You would find the cost of debt by simply understanding a few things. And I guess I'll write it on the side here just because I want us to have some space. So if you know that the coupon of the firm is equal to 47.5 every six months, you know that per year, the company pays, if you do some quick math, I'm gonna go ahead and say 9.5%, uh, $95. And we know that the coupon is a factor of the face value multiplied by the coupon rate. In this case, we understand that our coupon is 95 and we know that our face value is $1,000. Such that to solve for a missing variable, our missing variable would be 9.5%. Okay, that's gonna be our, our coupon rate. However, we know that this was issued at par. So if this is issued at par, we know that the coupon rate is equal to the yield to market. So the market expects the same interest payment on other bonds than what the Amaze Telecom is paying, such that we could say that the YTM is equal to 9.5%. Now, the last thing that we need to look at, right, the cost of debt, okay, so in order to get the cost of debt, what is the cost of debt? The cost of debt is how much interest, right, does a firm need to pay in order to raise some debt? In this case, it seems like, or in these types of questions, you want to assume like, that the company could only issue or raise debt by issuing bonds. In this case, for the company to be able to issue the number, the value that we have here, a bond of $1,000, they need to pay an interest, a cost, right, for their debt, for them to receive money, they need to pay 9.5% every six months. Not 9.5%, I mean, not every six months, they need to pay 4.75% every six months, but if we apply the, nat the, the natural idea of effective rates, we would know that our essentially our cost of debt isn't necessarily 9.5%. Our cost of debt actually, well, it has to be compounded. It has to be compounded to, for us to be able to find the cost of debt for, a, for the effective rate if we compound twice per year. That's essentially what I'm trying to say. Such that, sure, we found our yield to market per annum because we know the coupon rate, but we need to find our, our effective annual rate. That's what I'm trying to get to. And I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit loopy, a little bit tired, but we need to solve for our effective annual rate. Now, how would you go about doing that? You would go about doing that by just doing this, all right? So your effective periodic rate or effective annual rate to be one plus the quoted rate divided by two, in this case, over am I on drugs? No to the power of two, I think it's that minus one. I'm gonna do it in my head just to make sure. One plus zero, four, seven, five, power. Yep, I am not crazy. I'm not crazy, that is the correct amount. I'm just making sure that I'm not just for the nonsense. Such that your effective periodic rate, if you want the correct amount, is gonna be equal to 9.7256%, okay? So I'll take a step back, because I know I'm talking a lot, and I know I'm, I'm even getting, getting a little tired myself, because I'm doing this in one shot. But what I want y'all to remember is that 
In order for us to find the cost of death for these types of questions that tr are tricky, it may not be as complicated as this at all times, but they told you that they, I mean, not even told you, they gave you the coupon payment for like one, essentially one, like one interest payment. And we know that this company pays twice per year, such that you're able to find the total value of payments per year. In this case, it was 95 bucks. With that, if you understand how to find the coupon rate, you get the coupon rate of 9.5%. Because we know the bonds are currently trading at par, we know that 9.5% is equal to the yield to maturity, which is essentially the, like the actual cost of debt for a firm right now. And that's going to be 9.5%. But the thing is, we got to we gotta literally account for the number of compounding periods or the number of payments done by the company. So for us to find the number of compounding periods, for us to be able to find the effective cost of debt, we just need to look at the frequency of payments of the company. In this case, the frequency of payments of the company is equal to two, such that you would put your M in your effective periodic rate formula as being two, and you would get your cost of debt being equal to 9.73. Hopefully that gives you some context. <clears throat> so with that, you're able to find your cost of debt. Now we're smiling, this is getting easy. Now what we need to do is we need to find our equity value and our, our debt value. This is a walk in the park. Our equity value and our debt value is gonna be pretty simple. All that you need to do, because we're looking for the market value of debt and the market value of equity, is you just gotta take the number of shares or the number of bonds outstanding, multiplied by literally the trading price of those shares or the trading price of those bonds. In this case, I hope it's like straightforward. We're just gonna do A times B and the value of our equity is gonna be A times B, all right? That's literally all that we're doing. So we're going to take our 1.75 million shares outstanding multiplied by the current stock price of $245. That's going to give us a value of equity of value of equity of $428.75 million. Okay. Same thing applies for our debt value. What we're going to do is 250,000, which is the number of bonds outstanding, times the face value of a thousand per bond. And that's going to give us a value of debt of $250 million, okay? Now, if you know E and you know V, you're able to solve for V, right? So you're simply gonna do 428.75 plus 250. If I could do some quick math, that's gonna give us $478.75 million, okay? So now we could solve for WAC. I'm crazy, 678. Uh, you see, I'm getting a little bit tired. I'm not gonna lie, a little bit tired. But now that we have this, we could just kind of like, Put everything back into our our framework so we have our cost of equity we have our cost of debt and we have our value of equity and we have our value of debt and we have our corporate tax rate we also need to find our firm value which is v once we have that we're able to solve for our equity value or our equity over value which is going to give us 63.17 percent you can do a quick sense check right 428 million over 678 million that looks like 63.17 percent now, debt over value, well, that's going to be the reminder. Or you could simply do 250 mil divided by 679 mil, all right? And that's going to give you your value here as well. And once you have all that good stuff, as you can see, you have everything you need. You have your D over V, you have your E over V, and you have your TC, such that you just have to plug this in within your formula. And you're going to get a WAC of 9.53%. And this right here, ladies and gents, and everything, this will be our K, 9.53%, okay? Just like that. Now we could actually start solving this question because we need our K. K is our starting point. Because if you take a little step back here and you look at our framework that we've been working with literally throughout this whole session here, is that you understand that for us to find the present value of anything that's not occurring today, we need K because we need to discount those future cash flows or those future economic benefits, however you want to call them, by K. So that's why this should typically be your starting point. Always solve for K if it's not provided within the question. All right. Now that we have that, we could actually go ahead and solve for our operating cash flows. So it took us a few minutes to get there, but now we could get there. You know what I'm saying? So our operating cash flows. Our operating cash flows will, we need to understand a few things. We know our operating cash flows will be a function of, once again, a few things, our sales, our cost, and our tax rate. Here, our sales will, 
our revenues, we're gonna to need to do a little bit of computation for that. We're gonna to need to calculate our revenues. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and write it here, I guess. So we know that our sales is gonna be equal to essentially the number of clients. Essentially, if we look at for year one, there are sales, our revenues for year one will be our number of clients multiplied by our revenues per client. However, what we're gonna do here because we're sharp is we're gonna actually kind of tweak our revenues per client because we're gonna include our variable costs per client. So what we're gonna do here then is I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Sorry about that. We're gonna do our number of clients multiplied by our revenue per client less our cost of acquisition, our acquisition cost, I guess we'll write. Per client, okay? And that's gonna give us our margin per client. Okay? Because that's going to give us essentially our real our real sales, our real margin per. That's what we're going to call as being our revenue. It's going to make it easier for us. Okay, so just to make that super clear, what we're going to do is we're going to do three fifty minus three fifteen. That's going to give us. I could do some quick math in my head. I guess thirty five dollars per client, and because we have five hundred thousand clients, we're just going to do five hundred thousand times thirty five. And I don't know if I can impress y'all with some math again. <clears throat> I guess it's gonna be like 1.75 or 17.5, something like that. Just gonna be like our, our value in terms of revenue. And then what we're gonna assess as being our costs, well, our costs, we're just gonna allocate it as being our fixed overhead costs. Okay, that's what we're gonna put as our cost because we found like our adjusted sales. Okay, now with that said, let's actually go into the section and let's actually solve for it together. All right, so we can go here. And you notice that that's exactly what I did. So we're only gonna look at year one. So notice how we got 17.5, which is kind of what I mentioned earlier, which is us simply doing 500K clients multiplied by 35. And what I've allocated as our cost, well, that was exactly the fixed cost that we mentioned above, which was 3.5 million per year. No, there's no way I just said 3.5 million. Now, that amount less 3.5, 3.25 is going to give us our EBIT. The reason why EBIT is important is because our EBIT is what we're going to have before we actually look at our taxes, right? Our taxes in this case, we know our tax rate is what, 28%? Let me zoom out and go see. It is 28%. And I'll make sure that our numbers are correct just so that it works. Five. Now there should be a small adjustment here. Our small adjustment should be that the, this should be fixed costs and fixed costs, they don't change. So this should be $3.25 million all around. So I'm gonna just go ahead and change that real quick. And we'll solve these together so it's gonna be fun don't you worry all right okay awesome let me just think about something real quick look at something real quick just to make sure that this makes sense You know what, just because I'm lazy, I'm a lazy person right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that those fixed costs are gonna increase as well, okay? That's what we're gonna do for this question. Just because or else, I'm not trying to modify it, but we could modify it and it's gonna be easy as well, but we need to look at our fixed costs as being our own like individual cash flows, but we're not gonna do that now. 
So you're going to get 14.25 as being your earnings before income tax. Okay. Then you need to account for your income tax expense, right? Which is 28%. And then you would get your operating cash flows for year one. All right. That's what we want to be able to highlight. Now, knowing this, okay, having that amount, we can actually go ahead and kind of think about this again. Because we know that these figures are going to grow, if we go back, they're going to grow by 4.5% per year. And because it's going to grow by 4.5% per year, what we're going to do is we're just going to plug this in within our normal annuity form. I mean, our growing normal annuity formula. Okay. So we're going to plug in all of these values that we understand because we know what our payment is. We know what our K is. We know what our G is. We know what our N is. So we could go ahead and plug this in with our normal annuity formula. In which we're going to have one minus one plus K. I'm oh, sorry about that. One plus G over one plus K to the power of N. And with that, we're going to be able to solve for the present value together. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and do that because we want to be quick, okay? But when you plug that in, and we understand, by the way, that doing this one by one for every single year, that's going to be hectic. That's not going to be something that you want to do. So using your growing annuity formula is the best way to go about it, right? And with that, you're going to find out that the present value of these cash flows will be equal to 50 million, 125, 345, something like that, all right? So then we could go ahead and say, you know what? We solved for the first part of the problem. Now it's about going for our networking capital, our change in networking capital. So how do we go about that? Don't you worry. It gets easier from now on. However, this will be the first real time where we're walking through this together. So what we want to do is we want to look at every single year. Okay, We want to look at the change in NWC for every single year. And you're going to see how we do that when we have several different years. In this case, they told you that from year two to year five, our networking capital is going to be 320 grand. Okay, so we're going to have 320K for year two, 320K for year three, 320K for year four, and then 320K for year five, such that at some point your networking capital will be equal to zero for a few years, like you're changing networking capital. Let's go ahead and do this together. Sorry about that. I have to like get closer to my desk because my back's starting to hurt. Let's go, let's go ahead and write this down. So before we even look at our change in networking capital, what you notice is that the best practice if I was to take this exam again, if I was to take a class again, is you just want to write down what is your NWC for every single year. Make it easier for you, such that you're able to track the change on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay, It becomes very easy once you have that in front of you. And we could actually even walk through this example together. You know that here, well, for sure, there's a negative, there's like a, your networking capital is actually going smaller. Okay such that you know that if your networking capital is decreasing, this is a positive effect to the firm, right? So this is decreasing, so you have a positive effect to the firm. Here it's increasing, so you have a negative effect to the firm. Here it's also decreasing, so you have a positive effect to the firm. Here it's none of the above, nothing's happening, so zero. None of the above, zero. None of the above, zero. So year three to year four type of thing, year two to year three, year three to year four, put zero here. And then here we're increasing. So we're going to have a negative effect. So with that, you're able to kind of have a quick visual cue on what's going on. Okay. If we take a step back, you actually notice that whatever, everything that I wrote made sense, right? We always know that year zero, because it requires an immediate investment that has to be a negative value, right? So is that year zero? We know that, well, from year zero to year one, well, because it decreased, because our networking capital went from 2.5 mil to 450K, that means that a lot of the money that was initially trapped in the business, well, we got to recoup it, okay? Perhaps that means that a lot of the initial accounts receivables, they essentially were paid in cash. And a really good way to think about this, and we could put ourselves in the shoes of a business owner, let's say that you're starting a new business at which, like you're selling, you know, computers or yeah, let's say you're selling computers and phones, but nobody knows your product yet. Okay. So a lot of your initial products, you're going to sell them on, on, on credit to let people actually try the product to see how they like it. Then once they like it, they can pay you in full. It's like, you know, try it out. And then if you don't like it, money back guarantee type of thing. 
well, that's maybe what happened for this business for Amaze Telecom. And then after or during that year, right, they were able to recoup those accounts receivables because their product was so good. So putting yourself in the perspective of a business owner helps to kind of make sense of what's going on, or you can kind of like BS your way into like working through these questions with your own frameworks. Now, from year one to year two, well, it decreased further. So we were able to recoup more money that was lost in the business. So that's why here we have a negative amount, here we have a positive amount, and here we have a positive amount again. And as I mentioned be before, we have zero dollars, zero dollars, zero dollars. And then our networking capital increased from year five to year six, such that we have a negative effect to cash. So now you get to see what, to, what we're doing. It's very easy. The first step is you're going to plot every single one of these, either on your timeline or in a table. Then you're just going to find the change in networking capital. What happened from year zero, our initial investment, right? Our initial uh, investment in NWC to year one. Oh, it didn't stay the same? All right. It actually decreased? Amazing. Well, that means that we, we recouped somebody. So really using that framework helps you a lot. Now that you have the change of your NWC and you understand what's happening to cash for every single one of those years, well, we understand that money that you don't receive today, you got to discount them. So you could actually just discount every single one of these one by one. Of course, year zero is going to be equal to itself. Then you could do these together. And what I would recommend for you, because there are a few different ways you could do this, is either through one of the following steps. One, you could use the simple discounting method. So you would do every single one of these one by one and you, 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 you'd, you'd get tired very quickly. You could do that. You could use essentially your NP. I mean, I would just use my CF plus NPV formula and you would get the total present value of this. So really there's probably like two solid ways of going about it because notice how this looks like it's initial, like it's individual cash flow. Right, this individual set of cash flows at which you have an initial investment because you have something at year zero. So what you could go ahead and do, and I'll put it in a different color just so it's like very clear. Um, we'll go ahead with this. This would be your C. Okay, maybe it's not that clear. <laughs> we could go ahead and use a different color here. Let's go with this. This would be CF zero. This would be CO one. CO two. You could put CO three as every single one of these years. So you put frequency of three. And then this would be essentially your CO4, okay? So that's one way of going about it to make this quick for you such that you know how to solve for this. You don't need to like make this a long process. And if you want, without even seeing the answer, we could actually do it together. So if you were to open your CF function on your calculator like I am, you could plug in your initial investment. So you have $2.5 million, put it negative. You could put in your CO0 as being 2.0500, so 2.05 mil. Enter that. FO1 is equal to one. You put your CO2 as 130K. CO2, FO2 is equal to, to one as well. You put CO3 as being zero. You leave it at that. But then you're going to put your frequency as being three. Then you could go to CO4. You're going to put 200K, but it's going to be a negative 200K. And then you're good, right? What we want to do, though, is we need to remember that, <clears throat> sorry about that, my throat is a little bit rocky at this point. We can go ahead and solve for the NPV, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to use the CF plus NPV function. When you are here, just make sure to plug in your WAC, so your K, right? So it's going to be 9.53. And then you can do compute. And I'm curious to see what y'all would get. Yeah, that's exactly the amount that I got. So check this out. What I got is this. I got a negative value. Now, I hope this mirrors, but you're going to get minus 635,837.39. Look at what we got here. We got something extremely close. Of course, there's going to be a small nuance because on my like solution sheet, there is no like um, rounding error. I just plugged in a rounded version of her K. But the idea here is that on an exam, they would give you a plus or minus 1% margin of error. So you're totally chilling. And these types of questions, they show, you have to show your work so you wouldn't lose any points. But that's awesome. Just like that, you know how to solve for your present value of networking capital. It's awesome. So we got that out of the way, pretty easy stuff. 
Now we're going to go ahead and solve for our networking capital recapture. Your networking capital recapture is very straightforward. Your networking capital recapture, all that you're going to have to do, okay, is you're just going to have to sum all of your change in networking capital. So these values right here, right? And in this case, you're going to have 520K. And what's really funny, okay, what's really hilarious is that you notice that it's equal to the same value that you have at the end. So that's pretty interesting. So you're going to retrieve all of the money that's in the business. So there's two perspectives to, to have here. One, you could add all of your changes in networking capital together to solve what you're going to recapture. Or you could, it seems like you could take the last amount. You could take the, you know, the last value of networking capital when you're finishing the project. And because that value, you're receiving it at the end of the project and it's a positive value because you're getting the money that was trapped in the business, right? You have 520K trapped in the business, but upon termination of the project, you're able to retrieve that money. It's now it's back in your pockets, okay? Because that money, you're only retrieving it at the end of the project, it's at year six, you got a discount. So there's a few ways of solving for this. You can either use your PV function or your CF function on your calculator, but honestly here, Doing 520K over 1.0953 to the power of six would also work great. And it would give you 301,000 approximately. That would be the present value of networking capital recapture. Very easy stuff. Like now it's the easy steps, right? Whoops. And what about the salvage value? In order for us to solve for the salvage value, well, we need to understand, well, how much are we gonna be able to sell this project at in the future? And when will this happen? In this case, they told us in the prompt that we're gonna be able to sell this project or to sell whatever's left of the project for $15 million at year six. So this means that you're gonna get a positive cash inflow at year six. However, that $15 million, once again, is not being retrieved today. And because it's not being retrieved today, it's being retrieved in the future, we need to discount that cash flow. And for us to discount that cash flow, it's going to be simple. It's going to be 15 million over one plus K, which is our WAC, essentially to the power of six. So we have 15 million here. What you're going to do is you're going to take 15 mil over one plus K to the power of six. And that's going to give you the present value of period zero. This is just like simple reps one by one. Very straightforward stuff. Okay. At this point, you understand why we need to do that because we're retrieving money as part of the value of the project, right? It's like students who buy like a brand new super high-end MacBook for the university classes. And then they're like, you know what, when I'm done university, right? When I'm done taking my engineering or software engineering courses or whatever the case may be, I'll sell it off. So that salvage value is always in our calculations when we make a purchase, either a computer, either a house, either a car, whatever the case may be. The same, the same idea, right, for businesses. They're going to apply that logic as well. So just like that, we have our salvage value. And now the last step, last but not least, it's our tax shield. So our tax shield, how do we go about this? Well, for us to figure out what our tax shield is, once again, we need to look at, well, how much does this project cost us? It costs us $70 million. And we know that we're going to be able to sell it only for 15 mil at the end such that in terms of what has been depreciated on this asset, if I could do some quick math, it's gonna be $55 million. And that $55 million, we're gonna essentially depreciate it over six years. Now, can I do some quick math in my head right now? Probably not. We know that what, it's 55 mil, so seven, it's gonna be like, I don't know, uh, I'm gonna say like 8.16 million. No, it's probably not like 9.16, 8.16, something like that. That's gonna be like our depreciation expense. Let's see if my mental math is good. So you see here that once again, our initial investment is 70 mil. We know that the salvage value is 15 mil such that what's gonna be depreciated on this asset is gonna be $55 million. And you're gonna take $55 million and you're gonna divide it by six to find how much is our depreciation cost every single year. In this case, it's $9.16 million per year. But that's not what we care about. We care about, well, what is the tax yield that I'm gonna benefit from on a year-to-year -year basis here? Well, every single year, your tax yield will be equal to 
2.56 million dollars. Well, not really 2.56, but you, you get the you get the gist of it. Sorry about that. Now, once you have that value, what's amazing is that you can actually, well, you can appreciate them up to, to today because we understand that that tax shield is not occurring at year zero. It's occurring at year one all the way to year six. So we need to discount them individually. Now you could use a few methods. I say this every single time. You could do the sum of the simple discounting uh, formula. So you could do payment at period I over one plus K to the power of I. You would add all of them up together. You could use the PV function on your calculator, or you could use the compute CF. Uh, I mean, the CF plus compute and PV function. And I'll show you how easy it is to do the, the CF function. So what you would do is you go to CF, you do second clear, and you're gonna put CF zero as equal to zero. You're gonna put CO one as being equal to the tax shield, which is 2.566. Six six seven. Yep, that's correct. So you're going to have exactly this. Now I don't know if this is being mirrored, but you get the point. You're going to press enter, and this is going to occur how many times? Six times. So you can do enter for that as well. Then you go to NPV. You're going to put your um, your I as being equal to five point fifty three. Let me just make sure that that is correct. Still. Yeah. Then you do enter, and you're going to do compute for NPV, and you're going to get in my case, 11,334, but still, there's a rounding error, so it's, it's understandable. But you're still very close to the answer. And on the exam, you will show your work, and that will be adequate. That will be OK as a answer. So notice how it took me two seconds to write it, and I had the time to verify whether my inputs were correct. You could do the same. So now we have all of our values. We have every single one of these, one by one it gets mad easy now because all that you have to do is you get to add them up together. Add all the six categories together and you'll be able to find the net present value of the project. And in this case, the net present value of the project is minus 191,000. So it would be a reject decision. And that's how you solve a seamless, like a seemingly hard question, but it didn't really require a lot of steps on our behalf. Like it did, but they weren't complicated. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, what was the goal of today? Well, the goal of this session was to shed some light on a topic that students hate in their intro to finance class. But when you really take a step back and you look at it, you understand that this chapter is actually quite interesting for a few reasons. Because you could actually kind of take some of these skills and apply them to your personal life. Then, most importantly, I guess, you can actually empower yourself to be able to study for this chapter in a more human way, in a non-static way, and to actually understand what the heck is going on, such that you don't feel stressed when you're studying, such that you feel capable and empowered when you're studying, and that you're able to mark, like score extremely well on your exam for these questions at the very least. That's what we tried to do today. Now, it was a long webinar or web series or whatever the heck we want to call it. But within this web series, not only do you know the steps to take and the methodology that I would rec recommend, but you also understand what's the actual like business case for these things, right? What is the initial cash outflow? Why do we care about the tax shield? And where does it come from? What the heck is the NWC, right? So putting that in perspective was the goal of today. And I really, really do hope that after this webinar, you feel like you know what to do. You feel like you have the tools to do the right thing. And you feel like you're empowered. That's really what ISMA helps us all about. Now, what's awesome here is that there are a few questions that actually quite a few questions that we didn't do together. And these questions, you have all of your solutions there. Now, I will make an amendment to these questions just to make sure that the inputs and the solutions are the same, but I would definitely take this as an opportunity to practice. Okay, why not? Get the exposure to these questions and you have the solutions to them. And if you wanna have more step-by-step -step solutions or if you wanna have different sets of questions, well, there's actually a bunch of them on my website and on my YouTube channel, okay? So you can go ahead and follow those questions there. It's gonna give you even a, more of a perspective on these topics. So you notice how we touched on so many different things here. Now that said, listen, I hope this video was helpful. 
I hope it gave you the much needed context that I believe students uh, in commerce need when facing an intro to finance class and facing this uh, Goliath of a cash flow estimation chapter. Um, yeah, this was fun. I, I think you're awesome. I think you have all the tools in the world to do amazing. And if a, a weirdo like me is able to make sense of this, I'm sure you can because you, you're way better than me. All right. So that said, I'll see you in the next one. There's so many tools out there. And I hope that this is like one step towards you feeling more comfortable in that like studying process. So yeah, I'll see you in another one. Continue being awesome. Remember that you're a rock star and that this should not be something that makes you feel like school is difficult, that learning is complex. Sure, it could be complex, but when you have the right things and the right resources available, you can do this like fairly, fairly well. All right. So that's the, that's the, that's the vibe. Okay. Anyways, enough with all that. Continue working hard and I'll see you in another one.